message is being broadcast by the Department of Defense of the Republic. At 2 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, multiple unidentified objects were confirmed to have entered Earth's atmosphere. Discovery Houston, 20 seconds to LOS Tedris. Copy that. Thanks. The first message that comes to you is you are a divine being. You matter. You count. You come from realms of unimaginable power and life, and you will return to those realms. The vast stretches of the unknown and the unanswered and the unfinished still far outstrip our collective comprehension. Broadcasting from Forest Tower Studios, all the way from the Deep South. Now, here is your host, Joe Rubin. Broadcasting from a shack on a hill in the Mossy Creek bottoms of Cane Creek, Arkansas, this is Lighting the Void, and I am your host, Joe Roop. I hope you had a fantastic weekend. It is Monday night, December the 16th. On into the 17th, live here on the Fringe FM. And tonight, author and conscious explorer Paul Levy joins us to share his story of his out-of-body experiences, his journeys. We're going to talk about his writings and what happened to him back in 1981 and on to this day. And he's from Portland. And so this is going to be another one of those journeys where we get to hear about what happened to our guest and what led him into his experiences. And what he's doing today is pretty magnificent. The show is brought to you by GetTheTea.com. Make sure you go do that. Go get the tea. I'm currently trying the pomegranate stuff. Keep yourself cleansed from all those intruders. Drink it daily. Get rid of the junk. Also, the best CBD oil on the planet, Ancient Life Oil, AncientLifeOil.com, and Metaphorical Archaeology. If you've had a paranormal experience that's caused you any post-traumatic stress or trauma, you can get a free session by calling Barbara at 214 995 Three seven five four. I want to thank all of you guys for coming out tonight, hanging out with us. We're looking forward to another fantastic week here on the show. And um, if you want to donate, you can. You can go to lightingthevoid.com, hit the donate button, or grab any T-shirt or any swag that's there. We got all kinds of stuff. What we're doing though, right now, and I haven't got the pictures up yet, but we're giving away like some special stuff for people that donate during this holiday week for the next week or so. Uh, We're going to do another drawing, but we're giving away like a limited edition. And I was just going to do a hoodie, but some of y'all have changed my mind. So we're going to give away a limited edition Voidwalker sticker, shirt, and hoodie. So it depends on the tier that you donate on uh, as to what you get. So they're going to, it's going to look cool. No one's going to have one like it unless we change that in the future, which I doubt we will because that wouldn't be fair. But, um, I was hoping to have the pictures up by today, but I'll have them up by tomorrow. So if you donate $5 or more, you'll get in the drawing for the sticker. $10 or more, you'll get in the drawing for the shirt. Uh, $20 or more, and you'll get in a drawing for the Voidwalker hoodie. And another thing, too, I wanted to mention just really quick, a little house cleaning, is we had a guy that got a shirt that had a misprint on it. So his name is uh, Damien, and he's a really cool listener uh, for the show. So if you guys have any issues with what you get, Make sure you contact me. You can even hit me up on Facebook Messenger or something if that happens, and we'll rush you out another T-shirt. We'll get you taken care of. So, Damien, brother, don't you worry. We got you We got you taken care of. Also, uh, I want you guys to, if you haven't heard it yet, go check out a, a Tim Doyle show, which is backed by UFO Seekers. Now, UFO Seekers is backed by us, so if you want to keep a journalistic approach to what's going on in the UFO field, head over to ufoseekers.com. Follow them on Twitter at UFO Seekers youtube.com forward slash ufo seekers to watch the new season and if you've had a sighting that you'd like to report give them a call at 661 ufo 7889 um some other people left some feedback uh, i think it was on uh facebook reviews or whatever but for a moment there if you go to chartable i don't know we might have fell out of it but we were in like the top 50 last time i checked the top 50 for alternate spirituality podcasts. And I mean, the podcast is just like the archives. So that's saying quite a bit. 
because we're more like a live radio show than we are a podcast. So to be in the top 50 in that genre was really cool at uh, Chartable. All right, so let's bring on our guest. I wanted to give you guys thanks for that, by the way. Um, Our guest, Paul Levy, is here with us. And in 1981, Paul had a life-changing spiritual awakening in which he began to recognize the dreamlike nature of reality. Now, during the first year of his spiritual emergence, he was hospitalized a number of times, told he was having a severe psychotic break from reality, and misdiagnosed as having a chemical imbalance. Now, over time, integrating his out-of-body experiences, he has since become a pioneer in the field of spiritual emergence. A creative artist, Paul is a wounded healer in private practice, helping others who are also awakening to the dreamlike nature of reality. Paul is the founder of The Awakening and the Dream Community in Portland, Oregon, and he is the author of The Quantum Revelation, which is a radical synthesis of science and spirituality and dispelling Wetiko, which is breaking the curse of evil. A long-time Tibetan Buddhist practitioner, Paul was the coordinator of the Portland Padma Sam, I said it wrong, Padma Sambhava Buddhist Center for over 20 years. Now, you think I would know that because that's... Uh, Paul was educating me. He's like, you should know that, right? You should know how to say that. But welcome to the show, Paul. I really appreciate you being on here. Hi, yeah. I'm so happy to be here with you. Thank you. Padma Sambhava, right? Yeah, that's that how you say it. it. Yeah. <laughs> any any real Buddhist would know that. By the way, the website, uh, you guys, if you want to go check it out, is awakening or awaken in the dream.com. That's the website. Um, so yeah, run me, tell me what happened, because we're huge huge on the out-of-body experience i think you're like the first guest that we've had on that's well it, it wasn't an out-of-body it was an in-body experience actually really? but yeah but it was a completely over-the-top you know paranormal experience and if i could just create context for it so it happened in sure. 1981 and i was 24 and the context is that i was in incredible just deep pain and suffering and what had happened without going into the story um, I had always been a very happy, healthy kid and very, you know, good at school and a lot of friends. And um, but it wound up that my father, unbeknownst to me and to the rest of the family, was was a really sick guy. He was a really he was he was like this genuine psychopath. And I'm not just I'm I'm very careful with choosing my words. I mean, to say he was a psychopath, that's I you know I've actually had to create even new words to describe the level of evil that was coming through my father and one one very simple way of describing it just like when any of us have uh, have abuse issues and we haven't healed them we act them out on our partner or our kids or whoever and my father he acted out I'm, I'm the only child so he acted out his unhealed abuse stuff on me and it was particularly when i was beginning to individuate and separate when i was in college so when i got out of college and the, and the abuse, it wasn't physical. It was, it was just this emotional, psychological abuse. Huh. And I'm not going to go into the story. I've actually, I have a whole book, a 600 page book that I wrote about it, but it created enormous suffering, um, to cut to the chase. The only thing that I figured out to do that was alleviating the suffering, even the slightest was going inside of my mind and just assuming the position of the witness. Like I quickly figured out, I couldn't figure my way out of my suffering. And what happened after doing this, you know, just really going inwards in meditation for about average of about four hours a day for close to two years, I got hit by a bolt of lightning, but, but not, not from the sky, oh. but inside my brain, just a bolt of lightning ignited. Now, I didn't realize that so many of these, these different, um, you know, these, whatever, these traditions, these spiritual mystical traditions talk about awakenings being catalyzed by getting hit by lightning but that's so anyways i didn't know anything about that but basically what happened within 24 hours i went into such an altered state such an extreme state and i was so excited at what i was realizing because what i was realizing was that we're having a collective dream that this is nothing other than a dream and not that it's um this you know sort of like this um sort of simile or metaphor oh this is similar to a dream no i was actually having a direct experience that we're having a collectively shared dream that all of us are dreaming up together into materialization as this universe 
And I was so excited at what I was realizing, keeping in mind I was 24 and was totally unprepared for what I what was, you know, overwhelmingly being shown to me that I was just so enthusiastic and excited that within 24 hours, you know, people who knew me thought, oh, my God, he's having a psychotic break. He's having this it was like having like this radical like personality change. And so I got brought, I was down in the Bay Area, I got brought by ambulance to Highland Hospital in Oakland, California. This was May 1981. And, and then I get brought into my first psychiatric hospital. And if I, you know, within the minute, something happened in that hospital that radically changed the entire course of my life. So could I share that story? It's very quick, but it's amazing yeah, what happened next. So I get brought into Highland Hospital, and it's after dinner. It's it's nighttime. All the the mental patients are in you know not all, but a lot of them they're in like this this room with a TV and a lounge. They're all hanging out. I come in. I get brought in by the ambulance people. You know, getting admitted to my first psych ward, and I see this woman, and it's an older woman, and she, her eyes are blind. They're huh. her, you know no radiance in her eyes. She's totally, you know, it's opaque. There's her, you know, she's blind. So without thinking about what to do at all, cause I was in a completely open state where I was just like an instrument for whatever was coming through. I just was drawn to her and I went right up to her and I began just looking in her eyes. And as if I was given a script, all of a sudden, out of my words, out of my mouth came the words, all you have to do to see is open your eyes and look. All you have to do to see is open your eyes and look. And I kept on reciting those words over and over as I'm staring in her eyes, as I'm getting closer to her. And the whole thing took about a minute and she regained her sight. At that moment, as if it was choreographed, they took me and they strapped me up on a bed in another room. And that's where I spent the night. And it was so obvious to me that I was having a spur. I mean, you know, when something like that happens, it's kind of like, wow, it's pretty clear that you're having some sort of spiritual awakening. Now, were you, were you voicing this, though, like telling people that you were this was happening or were you being quiet at the time? About no, I, I you know, I, I didn't tell that. I mean, as soon as the blind woman thing happened, you know, they just took me and they, you know, grabbed me and took me and tied me up in the next room. So I, I wasn't at all like, you know, trying to communicate to them what had just happened or what my experience was. But I'm sure that what what led me to be put in an ambulance and to be brought into a psych ward was that I was just, you know, incredibly like, you know, um, excited and enthusiastic because like I was saying, I was I was waking up to the dreamlike nature. I was recognizing, oh my God, this is a collectively shared dream. And you know, it's it's this 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 archetypal experience that many people have had all throughout history. Well, it was happening to me. So then, what ha after they they put me on that in that room and strapped me up for the night? They unstrapped me the next morning, and here's the next part of the story. They put me in a room. And I'm sitting at a desk and the only other person in the room sitting opposite for me is that blind, that ex blind woman. And she's just, you know, with a big smile on her face, not saying a word to me. And we're just sitting there. And all of a sudden, my heart chakra, I had never had this experience. It just opened and I understood, oh, I get it. Her eyes were physically fine, but she wasn't letting herself look inwardly, psych psychologically. It was like she had. Uh -huh miracle blindness. And somehow I saw that. And it was like, I it was almost like I was an Uber driver. I was the one sent because I was the closest one like that. You know, I was the one they needed somebody to, to pass whatever, the message to, through, right? To like be the instrument to just say the very word she needed to hear to give her permission to heal because she was ready to heal her blindness. And all of a sudden, I understood that just sitting across the table from her. Then she asks me, you know, she says the only thing she ever said to me, and she asked me a question. She goes, aren't you going to answer the phone call from, and she mentions my father's name. And then within seconds, the nurse comes into the room and says, 
to me that my father was on the phone because my parents had just gotten a phone call that I had had a psychotic, a supposed psychotic break. And so I got out of that hospital after three days because the doctor convinced me I had to, you know, really convince him that I wasn't crazy or he was going to keep me there for a long time. So, you know, I thought about that and I was like, well, I don't really want to be here. So I just became totally, you know, went into just being normal. Here I had been in this incredibly ecstatic, expanded state. And I just began talking about my problems and, and all of that. And he let me go. He says, fine, you're, you're, you can go. And I actually got together with him for lunch. I called him up and I may, you know, we had, we got, we, we got lunch the next week. And he said to me, the fact that I could do that, that I could be really have the fluidity between identities that proved to him that I wasn't insane. Cause if I was, then I wouldn't be able to just step into being normal when I needed to. And then I told him about the blind woman and he got incredibly uncomfortable and he just said, Oh, I can't talk about that patient confidentiality. And so that was the initial start. And you see, that's what saved me. I was probably hospitalized three or four or five other times during those next couple of years because I was just a free agent having this life transforming spiritual awakening. And, you know, I hadn't integrated it yet. And um, I hadn't figured out how not to freak people out. Whereas now, close to 40 years later, you know, I figured that out real, real good. And I make a living out of teaching people about what I was realizing. Um, but it was really that next almost two years. Like I said, I got hospitalized a number of times. I always got diagnosed with, oh, you're, you have this chemical imbalance because the DSM three had just come out the year before with, and that was announcing the discovery of the chemical imbalance. And so every doctor said I, I was manic depressive. That's what it was called. Then I had a chemical imbalance and I knew they were complete idiots. They had no idea what they were talking about. And, um, and I should add those same doctors who wrote the DSM three book saying about the chemical imbalance, a number of years later came out and said, Oh, that's bogus. There is no such thing as a chemical imbalance that that was this meme made up by the pharmaceutical companies to sell more drugs so as to make money. I'm not making this up. I have the quotes of the very authors of the DSM three, a number of years later confessing that. But meanwhile, every single doctor was diagnosing me as having a chemical imbalance. And what saved me was an experience like that blind woman. When you have an experience like that, you know that you're having a spiritual awakening. It couldn't have been made more obvious to me. And that was one of many experiences that began to happen during that time. You know, so you said something interesting earlier when you told her that you said all you have to do is open your eyes and look and something about you saying oh, that you could regis right. you registered that it wasn't it's not that she wasn't seeing the world as we see it outside. There's something inside of us that causes us to see the outside world. Is that what you're saying? Something yeah. in our minds. Right. What I was realizing was that she that something in her inwardly was not was like shutting her eyes, was like she wasn't able to to open her eyes and you know, inwardly, the psycho the spiritual eyes, psychologically speaking, she was keeping her eyes closed. She wasn't able to open her eyes and look psychologically and that was manifesting as her physical blindness uh -huh. and that's in essence what i saw you know and i didn't see that in the moment i saw that the next morning when i was sitting in the room with her just sitting with her it was like i intuitively understood oh that's what had happened the night before you know now the thing wow. i should say it wasn't like this, this impossible thing that happened. It was unbelievably, you know, like highly ridiculously improbable that I would just, you know, be tuned in in that way and happen to be there and say those words, the very words she needed to hear to help her to heal her blindness. That was within the realm of possibility. It, it was not physically impossible. I, I just want to point that out. But the thing which is interesting when you actually contemplate that scenario as if it was a dream, and keep in mind, it, 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 it actually happened in, in actual life. But when you contemplate it with symbolic eyes, you, you discover, oh, my God, that's actually showing us something that all I did was just having a good intention, an open heart, wanting to serve the field. And there was healing that was potentially, that was, you know, possibly going to happen. 
And all I did was just offer myself as a conduit to, to let whatever wanted to come through me come through that catalyzed healing in another person. And when you recognize that's a reflection of what's available for all of us, that at any moment, if we have like an intention to really be of service to the field, oftentimes we then get cast in the role of being an open instrument to say something or to behave in a certain way that could help somebody else to, to actually heal or to wake up. Right. Yeah. Right. I see what you're saying. That's very, very cool. Uh, that's a, yeah. that's a very yeah. powerful experience. Um, I'm right. sure now on your website, which I love your website, by the way, I love the way the, the blog is structured and there's so many good points in here, but one that really got my attention was, um, where you talk about that psychiatry almost drove you crazy about the abuse you suffered at the hands of the psychiatric community. Oh my um, God. Where it was almost torturous or unspeakable. Can you tell me about that a little bit? Oh yeah, I'd be happy to. Oh my God. So here I am, uh, you know, so that experience that I just shared, I was only in that hospital for three days, but then, um, over that next close to two years, you know, like I said, there were three, four five other times I was hospitalized and a couple of them were for three weeks. And the three week ones were when they were getting me stabilized on medication. And in their view, I was needing to be on medication for the rest of my life. They were guaranteeing me that I had this, this mental illness, this chemical imbalance, that I needed to be on medication or I would have an immediate psychotic break. And what, what my experience was, was that whenever I was describing just from the um, phenomenological viewpoint of like what my experience was when I, when, whenever I was giving voice to my experience, they were pathologizing whatever I was experiencing. And they were basically saying to me, no, that's, that's not what you're experiencing. And I was, it was like a completely crazy making situation. Really so as soon as, as soon as I got diagnosed and had this label put on me, whatever I said or did got viewed through the lens that I was mentally ill. So anything I did just got integrated into the psychiatrist's viewpoint that that was a symptom of my illness. So it was so crazy making. And here I am in this unbelievably open, vulnerable, fragile state, like anybody is when they're spiritually awakening, because you typically, you know, it takes months or, or years to integrate what you're realizing. I was like fresh, you know, out of or in the experience. And, and then by them pathologizing me, it was literally making me sick. And then as soon as I began to become sick, then that proved that served as evidence to the psychiatrist that their diagnosis of me being sick was true. So they would even more see me as sick. And it was a feedback loop. It was like they were putting me under the very spell that they were under. It was maddening. It was so it was like psych. It was abuse to the max. And so I'm you know, I would love to be more of a psychiatric activist. Because I was having this living experience of like, oh my God, you know, endemic pervading the psychiatric community is this unbelievable unconscious shadow of madness where they literally abuse so many people who are locked up in psychiatric hospitals are actually having spiritual awakenings, going through a shamanic initiatory experience and are misdiagnosed and then are made sick by psychiatry. And it's tragic. They could be spending the rest of their lives in that circumstance. That sounds so frustrating. They had me on, on, on psych meds and it was, I mean, it was unbelievable. And like one final thing. So I was really, you know, kind of angry at myself that, oh, how did I end up here? And I really must have, you know, made a mistake. I, you know, could have been more awake. But then a number of years later, I had the realization that when I was hospitalized, that was part of the awakening. That was, in a sense, the descent into the underworld of the unconscious, the place of darkness, in a way, a hell realm. It feels kind of like Twilight zone just hearing you talk about it, actually. Yeah, yeah. it was like making the descent into Hades. And, and very fortunately, I didn't get stuck because having had an experience like the blind woman and many other experiences like that, it had been made incredibly clear to me that I was having an awakening. And I knew that there was no one who was going to talk me out of that. As they were diagnosing me, I was diagnosing them as just being stupid. I just could not believe the idiocy 
of the psychiatric community. And I'm not saying there aren't good people who are psychiatrists, well-intentioned, smart people. I'm saying the system itself is set up in a way that's insane. Yeah. I've got a friend of mine that, uh, speaking of that, which you could probably relate to, is trying to find the right therapist. And I said, you know what? You, you might need to look for a Jungian therapist. And, uh, you know, she's like, well, everywhere I go to, they're just asking me about how I feel right now and taking notes. They're not even asking me about my childhood, my upbringing. Just, it's really strange. It seems odd. It's, it's almost like they're looking just to find current symptoms so they can diagnose you. That's all they're looking for, you know, yeah, to find the symptoms, give a diagnosis. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have a lot to say about that because I went through years of therapy just related to the abuse from my father and then psychiatry. And it's the exception to find a therapist who's really awake and really switched on, you know. And um, I mean, just in a, a typical example, you go to a therapist, you know, when you're suffering and the therapist basically says with the best of intentions, oh, I can help you. Well, just take a look at what they're doing. They've already cast you in the role of somebody who's not whole and not awake. And, and so that's the, that's the person that they're having a relationship with. And, and then of course, you know, they have an unconscious incentive to do that because then they have a new client who pays them money every session as compared to when I was going to my, I found my teachers, these great enlightened beings, you know, from, from Tibet, Southeast Asia, different parts of the world. And they totally right away saw me in my wholeness. They saw me as, oh, Paul's having an awakening right. and only able to see me that way because they were in touch with that they were whole and that they were awake. So they were in relation to the part of Paul that was awake and that helped create a bridge for me to step into the awake part of myself. Fantastic. Uh, that makes a lot of sense to me. And I'm sure, you know, we've had other people talk about that too, where they finally realized that, hey, we all could be asleep. There's a lot of people asleep out there. When we come back, Paul Levy's going to speak with us a little bit more about Wetico, the virus of the mind, and his new book as well. Stay with us. Listening to the Fringe FM. Okay, nurse, let's get this man to the ER stat. Right away, doctor. We see this every day. Heart attack or angina pain due to blocked and clogged arteries. Chelation can remove obstructions or blockages from arteries and help avoid painful and expensive surgery. Now there's Angioprim. It's a liquid oral chelation product that you take with juice. You start to feel the results fast. Angioprim increases blood flow all over the body, and that means more energy and strength to take on the day with less aches and pains. 60 years of research has gone into chelation and angioprim is the result a safe and easy way to unblock your veins and arteries from buildup that slow circulation paging dr jones please report to the emergency room right away log on now to angioprim.com that's a-n-g-i-o-p-r-i-m.com or to speak with a trained consultant give angioprim a call at 954-882-7221 that's 954-882-7221 hey this is No Way Jose, a Northern California Piscean stuck in the Arizona desert. I'm a void walker, and I got the shoes to prove it. So what do I do when my soul yearns to delve deep into the realm of the unknown? I aim my satellite straight into the night sky and catch a smooth ride on the KTLKDB radio waves. I tune into Lighting the Void with Joe Root on the French FM. Joe, Lighting the Void is the best show on the planet. This is Barney, your friend from Facebook. Thank you and all the crew for all you do. Namaste, my friend. This is Macon from the Foothills, North Carolina, and I am a board walker. G'day, board walkers. This is Lily from Down Under Australia. The world may be small, but the enigma is great. So let your curiosity take you for a journey with Joe Root. Hey, this is V, coming in from Central Maryland, and I am a void walker. This is Kevin Darkerty, a beginner void walker. I'm from Vancouver, BC. I know a little about a lot, you know, as Leonard Skinner said, I guess the rest. I learned a lot from uh, Mr. Root and the show. And, uh, 
heard it from the beginning. I knew right then he was going to be a new art bell. Thanks for all your uh, shows and keep it up. Hey, this is Derek from Mass, a.k.a. the Night Stalker, and I'm a Void Walker. This is Mark from Chicago, and I walk the void to ascertain what is consciousness. My name is Jared Johnson, and I'm from Humboldt County, California. I do not know all the answers to the questions about reality. I do not claim to know the ultimate truth about life. I seek that which has been made hidden as a part of a family of explorers of consciousness. I'm a void walker. Thanks, Joe Root. Come, walk through the mossy creek and up the hill. Never mind the flashing lights and otherworldly shadows. They stay hidden within the trees. Come, step up to the shack and begin your journey to the answers that you seek. This is Lady Anne, and you are listening to Lighting the Void on the Fringe FM. Okay, here we go. Ancientlifeoil.com. Ancientlifeoil.com. Now, this is for CBD. Ancientlifeoil.com. Again, for CBD. Where do I get CBD? ancientlifeoil.com. It's pretty good stuff. Organic, non-GMO. We are the Ferrari of CBDs. Ancientlifeoil.com. You know, they say when you mention a person's name three times when you first meet that you're going to remember. So I'd say to you, nice to meet you, ancientlifeoil.com. It's ancientlifeoil.com, right? Nice to know that you help people. Ancientlifeoil.com. Think about this. Occasional stress, occasional anxiety, occasional inflammation, occasional stiffness, and intruders that get you down. Ancientlifeoil.com. Okay, so I'm going to give you a fact for the day. So Ancient Life Oil does not help you with business deals. Hold on a second. If you feel better, it could help you make a better decision. Okay, I'm wrong. Just remember to go to ancientlifeoil.com. You're listening to Lighting the Void. The call-in number is 1-800-588-0335. If you would like to text, you can text in at 501-777-5631. Paul Levy is our guest tonight, and you want to go check out the website, which is Awaken in the Dream. Dot com. You can keep up all the blog posts there as well. Before the break, Paul was telling us about his awakening experience in the hospital, as well as uh, the psychological, seems like, well, yes, the psychological hell he went through with psychiatry, it sounds like. And uh, how long did you say that lasted, where they were trying to treat you and give you medicine, just to recap that, by the way? Well, that was, you know, that whole experience took probably a little bit under two years, but then I was forced to see a psychiatrist because I was court mandated to be on medication for a little while. But then I just very quickly took myself off. And, um, you know, but then I was in incredible trauma from, um, from the abuse of psychiatry and, you know, but, but then I continued after getting myself off the medication real quick and, getting out of psychiatry, um, I, you know, was able to continue my awakening, but I was deeply in trauma between the abuse from my father. And then on top of that, the abuse from psychiatry. So for, for, you know, a number of years, probably from, so from 81 through 94, I was just going to therapy and connecting with my dreams and doing meditation and making art, um, young, studying young, studying alchemy, studying shamanism, just anything and everything I could do to make sense of what I had, what I was experiencing. And, and then at a certain point in the mid nineties, I realized, oh wow, now I've integrated enough that I have something, um, that I've achieved through my ordeal that I can help people. I can actually really be able to show people or teach people or just help people to navigate what I, you know, had to go through. And so that's when I began to open up my, you know, my private practice and began teaching. But the tragic aspect was that my parents both died a few years after that, and they completely had bought into the psychiatric diagnosis that their son just was mentally ill and was in denial of their illness and needed to be on medication. And um, so that once they died, the rest of my family 
completely excommunicated me. And so I haven't had a family for close to 20 years, but keep in, I have a, you know, a ton of friends and I have a whole community that's formed around my work. So I'm, I'm fine. But it, all that I'm saying is that there was a tragic aspect to the awakening. It was like some sort of evil energy through my father. He was the vehicle had gotten into the Petri dish of my family and destroyed my family. It was like my family had gotten taken away. But through that experience, that was part of the awakening. Something was actually being shown to me. And that's where I began to discover my work. And that's what helped me to write my books. So what do you think was was being shown to you? That, that we're living in a very vivid dream world? Is that what was being shown to you? One, that was when I first was having the awakening in 81. That was what overwhelmingly I was realizing was that, oh my God, we're moment by moment dreaming each other up into materialization. But then when I was just describing about my family, so my father, he was in the role, you know, without going into the story, cause it's unimportant. He was in the role, uh, he was the figure of the abuser. And what I began to realize was that, so I was the one who was tracking that and was trying to shed light on it. And what I couldn't believe was that the whole family system, the whole field, including the mental health system with the psychiatrist, would actually protect the abuser, was protecting my father. It was as if when light was getting, was flooding in to expose the darkness, the field would configure itself to protect the darkness. So what I was beginning to discover, yeah, I was realizing that we're, we're having a collective shared dream, but then I was getting incredible insight into the nature of evil. And I was realizing, oh my God, evil is a field phenomena. And, um, you know, so that's what I, I wrote a whole book about the Watiko virus. It's a mind virus. And the word Watiko, it's a native American term that connotes the spirit of evil. And, and I, I was realizing that, oh my God, when you actually really start waking up and you're transducing light, what that light has no benefit whatsoever unless it illumines darkness. And so I was beginning to realize, oh my God, I was beginning to understand in a way the covert operations of archetypal darkness that my father was unwittingly the instrument for he had become possessed by and the whole non-local field around him, the family system and the mental health system had configured itself to protect the darkness. That's what I mean that, wow, something almost like a higher dimension of the universe of our experience was being revealed to me through what was playing out in my family system. And I can say a lot more about that. Okay, so this has been a perpetuate. So Watiko, what's I said Wetigo, but it's pronounced Watiko. This yeah, is however. something that's been like perpetually handed down through, I guess, the beginning of time. I mean, what started it? Yeah. Was it always here, or do you know the history of it? An interesting question, and I'm not even sure how to answer that. But um, think about it. So the thing about about Watiko, it's actually getting recreated in this moment. So. Who's to say whether it got started at a certain point historically right. in linear time or from time immemorial or there was a certain trauma or there were, you know, like negative ETs or who knows what the actual origin of it. But for me, the important fact is that the origin of it is in this moment. And it is, you know, in the Castaneda books, for example, they, they don't call it Watiko. He calls it different names. But um, he has like, you know, um, the in 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 their way of, uh, the, you know, sort of in their tradition, they talk about that. Yeah, this is the topic of topics for shamans. It is the most important thing in the universe. And it is if we don't come to terms with what and it doesn't make a difference what name we call it. Every spiritual tradition calls it a different name. But. They're all pointing at exactly the same thing. And it's a mind virus. It's a psycho-spiritual disease of the soul that afflicts our species. What Watiko is, it's a, it's a madness, a collective madness that operates through the blind spots it's in a way that we then, when we're afflicted with Watiko, we have this 
blindness, but we actually believe that we're seeing. And not only do we believe that we're sighted, we believe that we're more sighted than people who are actually seeing clearly, okay? And it works through the projective tendencies of the mind in such a way that it tricks ourselves out of our mind. Uh, another way of saying that is that we then hypnotize ourselves and we entrance ourselves. So our own genius for calling forth reality and co-creating our experience of ourselves in a way turns against us and imprisons us. Like we have these in this incredible creative genius power to actually co-create our experience of ourselves and our experience of the universe. And what Tico actually in a way plugs in, like I'm saying, through the blind spots, through the projective tendencies of the mind, and actually turns our genius for reality creation against us in a way that we're killing us. And that's what my work is about, is trying to illumine this, because if, if enough people actually wake up to what I'm pointing at, we can avert catastrophe, and we can then help each other to wake up. If you know people, if not enough people actually wake up to what I'm pointing at, and other people are pointing at it, guaranteed we're, we're committing collective suicide. We're killing ourselves. We're destroying the biosphere, the life support system of the very planet. So what I'm saying isn't just like sort of theory. It's not new age woo woo. This is like the real thing. And as a Westerner, I've just tried to translate this indigenous wisdom and translate it into a psychological idiom in a way that actually can, can have meaning for people. Well, that is a, that is a really valid point too, but it's also kind of a freaky when you think about it because I'm trying to think in my mind and I don't know why I'm even going there because it could just be a natural thing that has its purpose in the universe, but something like Watiko that's out there, it makes me think of that the movie, uh, uh, bird box and stuff where people, have you seen that? Do you watch Netflix or anything by the way? Um, well, I, I, I don't. Yeah. <clears throat> they, they, they're reenacting some of this stuff in movies, which I think is kind of funny. And it's like this virus that in the, in the movie with Sandra Bullock, it's like this virus that spreads that goes through people's eyes. And she literally has to blindfold herself and her children as she moves through life and tries to survive because whatever this thing is, is seeping through people's mind through their eyes in the movie. And I think writers sometimes do that in science fiction. They put certain mm -hmm. messages and stuff in there, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Totally. Well, the thing is a lot of artists and, and sci-fi writers, they're literally, you know, talking about Watiko, but just in a different way and in their own symbol system. And um, now the thing, what, what I don't want to do, because Watiko, it feeds off of fear. And I don't want to create fear because Watiko ultimately doesn't even exist. There's no such thing as Watiko, okay? It has no independent intrinsic existence from its own side at all. So there's nothing to be afraid of. And yet, here's the paradox. It can destroy our species. OK, and and that's pointing at that we have this incredible, unconscious, invisible power in us. And but to the extent that we don't we're not conscious of that, that incredible creative power gets turned against us in a way that's not only imprisoning us that but that's killing us. And if I could just give you an example, say so I want to invoke the imagination. So say if um, you're in this, like in a, at night and you're having a dream, right? And you're holding a viewpoint in the dream, right? Well, what is the dream? The dream is just your own mind. It's just a reflection, a projection of your own mind. So whatever viewpoint you're holding is getting, you know, fully dreamed up and reflected back through the dreamscape. Now, when you change that viewpoint in that dream, that dream has no choice but to instantaneously shapeshift and reflect back your change in viewpoint because the dream is nothing other than your own mind. But that process doesn't happen over time. It's not like this lag in time, like it happens three seconds after you change your viewpoint, the dream will then change. No, it happens in no time. It happens instantaneously, faster than we can think or blink, and faster than the speed of light. And what happens as soon as we then have that new viewpoint, now the dream has shapeshifted and is, is reflecting back that viewpoint. So now we have evidence of 
the objective reality of our viewpoint. So then we become even more fixed in that viewpoint. And the more fixed we become in that viewpoint, the more the dream will just offer us more evidence confirming the objective truth of that viewpoint. That's a feedback loop. The origin of that feedback loop is within our own mind. And guess what? We've just entranced ourselves. We've hypnotized ourselves by the power of our dreaming, by our genius for creating reality in a way that we've then like tricked ourselves out of our own mind. What I've just described, that's what Tico. Wow. Yeah. So, okay. Yeah. So it's like a, uh, it's like a feedback loop loop that keeps giving you the, the illusion that you're asking it for, or that, you, that you're believing yeah, exactly. in. Hmm. And we become, and we become fooled, you know, by our own creative genius. And what I'm pointing at is when you see that process and that was, you know, that's what I was beginning to see when I was having my awakening in 81 and got brutalized and traumatized and almost destroyed by psychiatry. And yet I'm fortunate in that I was able to go through that experience and it was so horrific. And I mean, I'm still a work in progress. I'm still like, you know, kind of integrating what I had, a, you know, the unbelievable suffering and pain that I had to go through to, to get to this place in my life. But then what really helped me was once I found my voice and I was able to, you know, be able to articulate what I was realizing, like I'm doing with you here, then, you know, I was realizing, oh, wow, this can really help people. And, and, you know, as soon as I began teaching in, in 94, I think I, I began making a living. And so I've been fortunate in that I haven't had to do anything other than this since 94. And it's all come out of that experience. And I'm still incredibly pissed at psychiatry. I mean, I don't even know where to start of in a way how angry I am because in a sense, psychiatry literally destroyed my entire family and it almost killed me, you know? So I was really fortunate to make it out alive with my sanity intact. Yeah. It does seem like, I got to tell you, man, like I know a few people that are getting just like regular, I guess you would say Freudian therapy and it doesn't right. seem to be helping them. I'm I got to tell you, just, it seems like it seems yeah, like it's well, perpetuating the madness like you're yeah, talking yeah. about. I went through years of therapy and I mean, it helped me a little bit, but it, it didn't really get to the core issue because for me, you see what, what happened with the abuse from my father was that in a sense, um, like I'll just give you an example, like, you know, at the worst of the worst of the the continual episodes of, you know, of him just, you know, going totally whatever. I'm not going to describe it, but just insane. One way of understanding it is that he was possessed by Watiko and he so abused me psychologically, emotionally, that it was like my, the the boundary of my soul got shattered. And it was like I got a transfusion of the Watiko of the virus in me. And the day after this happened, the worst episode ever, I got a fever and I had a fever, that fever for a year. And I went to doctors and hospitals and did all the tests. And there was nothing that any doctor could find that was physically the matter with me. That was nothing was wrong with me physically, but yet it was a shamanic illness. I had gotten my boundaries had been completely obliterated by my father and something dark that was using him as its vehicle came into me. Now, why I'm describing this, all of a sudden, you see, if I didn't connect with the shamanic archetype, and I'm not saying any, I'm any sort of shaman, only in my, in my wildest dreams am I a shaman, but the archetype of the shaman became activated. And the shamanic archetype is related to the wounded healer. And what the shaman and some and becoming a shaman, no one in their right mind would ever choose to become a shaman. You'd have to be completely out of your mind because the suffering is so intense and invariably. But the shaman, always, it's always a calling. You always get called. And then the important thing is to assent, to say, OK, I will cooperate with this calling. Then all of a sudden you get supported. If you say, no, 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 I can't. I can't do that. I can't be a shaman. If you're being called, that's when the would-be shaman gets sick 
and can really go crazy and can even die. Now, invariably, if they ascend to the shamanic calling, you have to descend into the underworld, into the place of evil and demons and madness and death. And I was realizing in psychiatry, that's what had happened to me after, you know, I was able to recontextualize that and understand, oh, that was my shamanic descent. But the shaman also takes on the illness. They become ill of the person they're working with. And but what makes an accomplished shaman a shaman is that they're able to bring themselves back to health, to their wholeness. And, um, huh. you know, so that's what I mean when I was saying, when I was just describing, yeah, I got this transfusion, the very evil that had taken my father over and was using him as its instrument for, uh, for, you know, incarnation into, into our family. It almost killed me. And I'm still a work in progress, continually trying to metabolize that Watiko, that evil. And the key thing is expressing myself creatively. If I didn't connect with being a creative person, just being an artist and a writer and being able to just creatively express myself like I am right now, if I didn't find my creative voice, I would have been in deep trouble. Okay, so the, the real solution or one of the major solutions for, for dealing with trauma and abuse and Watiko or evil, whatever you call it, is to connect with the creative spirit. So is that what you consider the the art of alchemy or the sacred art of alchemy? Is that what that is? To you? Well, it's, it's totally related to this because, you know, I've, I've written extensively about alchemy and I've studied it. And the idea of alchemy is that it's taking like the real, the rejected stuff, what's called the prima materia, the chaos, the shit, the stuff that you reject. It's taking the dark matter and it actually is puts it in, in a container. Think of like a, a test tube. And there has to be the fire of awareness under the test tube, right? That's consciousness. That's the self-reflection. And the test tube has to be sealed. And the fire of awareness, all of a sudden there's pressure that builds up in that test tube. And if it's not sealed, the pressure is just going to escape and, and nothing's going to happen. But when there's if there's too much pressure, it'll blow its lid and then you're back at square one. But the idea is to have that pressure of awareness through the self-reflective contemplation that's symbolized by the fire of awareness under the test tube and gradually that lead, which is the prima materia, which is the negative patriarchy, Saturn, the wicked father, interestingly, symbolically, that prima materia transforms into the gold and the gold is the enlightened mind. That's the awakened state. And that's really what alchemy is all about. It's like transforming, transmuting are the the wounds and are the 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 obscurations into something that's actually like an expression of our nature instead of an obscuration to it oh okay so this would explain like the double slit experiment kind of now if you think about well, it when yeah, we well, view it, it it's not it's nothing right like it's a wave but then when we view it it's a particle so there's that constant feedback loop so everything's yeah. about our related. beliefs and expression. It's related to the double slit experiment. Like my, my recent book on quantum physics, um, you know, I, I point out in essence, what I point out is that the, the insights that are emerging from quantum physics are the medicine for Watiko. And the whole basis of quantum physics is the double slit experiment where that's the experiment in which consciousness entered the physics lab. And, and the physicists realized, oh my God, if we set up the, the experiment in a certain way and ask certain questions and interpret the data in a certain way, for example, if you look at light, sometimes it'll manifest as a particle, other times it'll manifest as a wave, depending on how you set up the experiment. And they were realizing, oh my God, depending on our consciousness, that's actually influencing the answer we get from our experiment. And so that just blew apart. So quantum physics, like I'm saying, it's the medicine for Watiko because quantum physics has proven, empirically proven again and again, that the universe that the physicists were studying before quantum physics came onto the field, the classical physicists were studying what they thought of was an objective universe that existed separate from them. Quantum physics comes along and proves that's nonsense. There's no such thing as an objective universe separate from us. 
because the act of us observing the universe is literally influencing the very universe we're observing. We are literally dreaming up the universe. The observer, the universe that we're observing, and the act of observation are not separate. They're all part of one whole quantum system. So quantum physics has empirically discovered that this is a collectively shared dream. That's what quantum physics has discovered. It's also discovered that the, uh, the act of observation is creative and that we are creator beings made in the image of our creator. And this is what I mean when I say that quantum physics is the solution for Watiko. Because Watiko, we get entranced in thinking the world exists separate, objective, solid, separate from us. We then react to it, become conditioned by it, and we've entranced ourselves by our own projections. Here comes quantum physics. It's the medicine for that. It's showing us how to see through that. Yeah, you know, what? do you find it hard to speak to people to get extremely polar about subjects? Because I think, I think... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Totally. I mean, I think that's really what hurts us the most. And we were talking about on the show the other night, that's like 2020, and we still got people battling over polar things, like really going tooth and nail at each other about it. Well, and, here's the thing. Yeah, if I could just say the thing about Watiko, it feeds off of polarization. So, for example, say if I see somebody, whoever, whether they're Republican or Democrat or president or whoever, doesn't make a difference. And if I think, oh, they have Watiko. And if all of a sudden, if I'm thinking they have Watiko and I don't, right. I'm in a polarized point of view. And by holding that viewpoint, I have unwittingly fallen under the thrall of Watiko. You see, but if I see, oh, that person has Watiko and they're a dream character, which is to say they're an embodied reflection of that part of me, they're reflecting the part of me that has Watiko. They're not separate from me. I've dreamed them up, you know, and they're actually uh, this mirror image of that part of me that has Watiko. Then all of a sudden I've seen through the separate self and that's to begin to wake up and that's to begin to heal Watiko. So we're, uh, I've never seen such a polarized body politic where everybody is entrenched in their viewpoint and you can't even talk to people who have a different viewpoint. And I've been saying to people, what's like a, the superhero power that's needed is for us to be able to at least try to entertain what somebody who doesn't agree with us, how they're seeing, because maybe they're seeing something that we're not, and maybe we're seeing something that they're not, but as more and more of us begin to start to be able to do that, to be able to at least in imagination to open up to how are other people who don't agree with me seeing, that can create some sort of, of way of dialoguing, of communicating, of communing. Yeah, I see what you're saying. It's almost like that's that whole thing that Christ was teaching in parables. I mean, the minute you point your finger and say, look at that over there, I'm glad I'm not like that. You're you're automatically talking about you're judging yourself because there really is no separation, right? So we need to kind of all understand that yeah. we're all a part of this thing. Young talked about that too with the shadow, you know. Yeah, yeah, totally, and no, absolutely. And the idea, one of the ways of dispelling Watiko is seeing through the separate self and having the recognition that we're all interconnected. Yeah, that's that fantastic. We're, that, that we're interdependent. We depend on each other for our own well-being. Right. I wanted to get with and talk to you a little bit more uh, about the uh, quantum physics uh, stuff as well. And your new book, uh, what you got in this book as well, quantum physics, the physics of dreaming, um, all of this stuff, if we can, when we come back. All right. We'll be right back, guys, with Paul Levy. Life and into your life. This is Art Bell, and you are listening to Joe Roop and Lighting the Void here on the Fringe FM.
This is Barbara Charlton from Metaphorical Archaeology. If you've ever had a traumatic paranormal experience, the effects of it may stay with you for years. Uh, Who do you talk to? You can't go to conventional hell. They may think you're having a psychotic break. What we do is we use emotional freedom techniques or tapping to actually neutralize the effects of that event. Maybe when you tell the story now, your heart races and your palms get sweaty. You don't even want to think about it because you don't know how to neutralize that. That's what EFT tapping does. It neutralizes those emotions. The circuit that that was recorded on is gone. The energy flows freely and you're free of it. And that's what emotional freedom is all about. We offer this as a pro bono service, but this is something that I offer because no one, it seems, is helping people with these experiences. If you'd like to reach me, it's really easy. My cell phone is 214-995-3754. Please leave a message. I will get back to you as quickly as possible or you can email me barb.eft at gmail.com and EFT stands for emotional freedom techniques reach out to me it's confidential this works you won't believe the results I'm Ryan Gable and I want to remind you to keep your radio phone tablet or computer tuned to the fringe FM and visit the website thefringe.fm to listen to the entire lineup of shows. You can also catch my broadcast, The Secret Teachings, Monday through Friday, beginning at 12 a.m. midnight U.S. Pacific Time, right here on The Fringe FM. You can tug all day long on a carpet that's been glued to the floor. Then you hurt. There are many strong glues out there. Let's see, there's liquid nails and Gorilla Glue. You ever try to remove 3M5200? That adhesive is strong. Then there's bathroom caulk, silicone rubber, adhesive tape, super glue, flex tape, and stickers. Graffiti. Scientists have come up with glues that stay stuck and can't be removed. Until now. Until Handyman Formula by DeBond. That's right. 95% of adhesives become unstuck when you spray Handyman Formula directly on them. Just spray, wait a few minutes, and remove. It's amazing. Most adhesives become unstuck when you use Handyman Formula. Visit DeBondCorporation.com or MCMaster.com. Call 561-575-4200. This stuff really works. Handyman Formula by DeBond, a great Christmas gift. Alex X. Hi, I'm Alex Exum, and you're listening to The Fringe FM. Why is it we're not very good with our health regiment until it's too late? We don't put oil in the car until the engine blows up. When the body's out of balance, your health is not so good. Give your body some love. Log on to GetTheTea.com. That's GetTheTea.com. Try our Life Change Tea, which cleanses you from harmful intruders. A clean colon is one of the ways to bring the body in balance. We also carry organic supplements to help you get where you need to go. So do your body a favor. Log on to GetTheTea.com. That's GetTheTea.com. You can even visit our sales page to save some dough. Uh, Does anybody call money dough anymore? Anyway, if you're looking for short, helpful health tips, go to YouTube and punch in Health Matters Now. That's Health Matters Now. So, log on to GetTheTea.com, shop, get balanced, then learn some cool tips at Health Matters Now. You'll be glad you did. That's GetTheTea.com. This is Reverend John M. Polk. Please visit me at JohnPolkMedia.com and visit my show, Quantum Hologram Matrix, 5 p.m. Pacific, 8 p.m. Eastern, every Tuesday on TheFringe.fm. Is that a new music app? Yeah, check it out. Surfer Music Discovery. It links to thousands of online stations, but the twist is you see the song names and artists that are now playing live. That's different. No guessing. Looks like a waterfall of music. So many formats. Rock, oldies, country, R&B, jazz, and a whole lot more. How's that spelled? Surfer. S-U-R-F-R. Is it expensive? It's free. No need to sign up or sign in. Get the Surfer Music app free from Google Play or the App Store. This is Crow Triple Seven, and you are listening to The Fringe FM.
to call Joe, pick up the phone, dial 1-800-588-0335, toll free from the United States or Canada. You're listening to Lighting the Void Radio. Welcome back to Lighting the Void Radio. I'm your host, Joe Roop. If you're just joining us, our guest tonight is Paul Levy from the website AwakenInTheDream.com. His new book, The Quantum Revelation, A Radical Synthesis of Science and Spirituality, is what we're discussing tonight. And before the break, we were talking about uh, the Watiko, which is like this mind virus of evil that's been perpetuated through humanity, as well as Carl Jung and the Shadow and... I'm just now getting the grasp of this, I think, Paul, and maybe you can help me with this, too, is, is that it's kind of like when uh, I always thought shadow work was like, okay, I'm working out my own demons. It's my stuff that I'm working out, just me. But the more that I study young, the more I realize that he's like, no, 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 wait. So you're going to point your finger at somebody and say, look at that person over there. Look how terrible they are, or they're a murderer. I would never do that. And... At the minute we separate ourselves from these people, we're not looking at this correctly because would we murder somebody? What's the situation? Do we have that capability in us? So we're really pointing our finger at the collective and saying, this is what I don't like about me or us, right? That's what I'm getting so far. Yeah, well, you know, it's really important to understand the the shadow idea. Um, And we all have like a darker half. And we tend, so many of us tend to think of ourselves, our self-image, we identify with, oh, I'm a, a good, kind, spiritual person. Well, just take the polar opposite of that, and that's, that's how your shadow sees the world. And we all have a darker part, and there's a personal aspect to the shadow, and there is an archetypal aspect that's sort of like built into the collective unconscious. And, and um, the shadow, really, psychologically speaking, is at the core of, of Watiko disease. And one way to understand this is that, you know, say if I'm not in touch with my shadow, so I've disassociated from my own darkness, I, I become one-sided, I've identified just with being light, and, but I've split off from my darkness. Well, if this is a dream, what happens? when we split off from a part of ourselves, it gets projected outside of ourselves and it will literally get dreamed up and into the dream, be it night dream or waking dream, because this is very dreamlike, this reality. If we project out and dissociate um, and dream up our, our darker half, somebody will carry it. We'll have like somebody who we will project onto them, the shadow, or they have a hook even if it's 1% of that darkness in them that think about hanging your coat on a hook, that's the hook for us to hang our projection. And then as soon as we do that, we're not causing them to act out in a shadowy way, but we're making it more probable because when we project onto somebody like sort of a darker energy, we're in a way unconsciously invoking them, making it more probable for them to actually engage in that shadow behavior. And as soon as they do, as soon as they embody that shadow, we now have evidence. Oh, the darkness, the evil is outside of myself. We become even more identified with our light, even more split off from our darkness because now it's actually out there in full embodied form. So we become even more fixed in our viewpoint of the evil is outside of ourselves. And of course, the other person's probably doing the same thing to us. And but the more we do that, then we by projecting the shadow, we will then actually try to destroy the person who's carrying it, which is a a reflection of the initial inner process of us trying to get rid of and destroy our own darkness. And by doing that, we've literally we become possessed by the very evil we're trying to destroy. Yeah, and exactly right. That's that's shadow projection. Jung calls shadow projection the lie, and who's the liar but the devil, and and that's the psychological dynamic that informs and underlies Watiko. Doesn't it? So you wrote an article about uh, uh, Rudolf Steiner and uh, the Christ, etherical Christ, or the mythical etherical type Christ figure, and I yeah. find that really interesting too. Just the story. Because if you look at that story, it talks about that. Like, why would he come in here and go straight to the centers and eat and dine with them and talk with them and tell people not to judge each other? 
and then die and then say, look, just forgive them. They don't, they don't know what they're doing. Like they're caught in this elusive state of polarity where they're wanting to tear each other apart, therefore manifesting this Watiko or whatever this is that keeps us fighting each other. And there's so much in that Christ story, just the stories, that's oh, totally. incredible. I, I, I trip out on that all the time. And like the, the Steiner article, Steiner made a prophecy and he predicted that in the 20th, 21st century, that that humanity, that the etheric Christ was going to be incarnating through us, through our unconscious. And it was the second coming. But he said before that would be actualized, we would have to encounter the beast. In other words, we would have to encounter the shadow, the darkness, evil. And, and that's exactly what's happening. And, and, and that's why you know, as part of my whole awakening process, I'm like, you know, there are a lot of people who just talk about love and joy and all that. And that's super profoundly important. I mean, you know, all feeling joyful and, you know, having an open heart. Those are the pillars of really of, of awakening. But we don't want to forget about that. You know, I, I think of the, the famous saying, Jung says the way to enlightenment is by making the darkness conscious. And that's what I'm talking about. I'm, I'm trying to flood light on how the darkness works out in the world and through our reactions. Because what Tico gets fed, when we turn a blind eye on the darkness, when we are colluding with it, when, when by turning a blind eye, we're avoiding it, we're unwittingly empowering it. You know, we're strengthening evil by, by not dealing with it. And by reacting against it, we're unwittingly feeding Watiko. So in my book, I talk about all the ways through our unconscious that we're actually colluding with the very evil that we're fighting against. And, um, and the thing which is interesting in bringing this work forth, I've literally had to encounter unbelievable darker forces in the world and in my own mind that have been trying to stop me from bringing this out. And But thankfully, I understood, well, of course, that's the way that would be happening because when any of us brings in light into the world, you know, it's going to like, it's going to invoke sort of the opposite. It's going to illumine everything that's not light. And, but the problem would be if we get caught by that and stuck in that and identify within that stuck place or with that darkness. But if you actually have the meta point of view and, and recognize, oh my God, there's all this darkness happening in the world or in my process as I get closer to expressing myself, well, yeah, that's the way it works. That's a sign when there's such great darkness that's showing that the light is really, really close. And that recontextualizes everything. Right. So don't you find that hard though? I mean, I understand what you're saying, but it's almost like when I go out into the real world, if I keep that mentality, I can't relate to a lot of people. It's almost like I have to shut myself back off just to function or keep my sanity. Well, I feel that's I, where I'm at sometimes, but I, I'm kind of a shut in, I would say. Yeah, what, what I've had to do, I've had to learn to, to navigate. And I've gotten like when I first had my awakening and I didn't know that. And I was just so excited at what I was realizing. It was talking to people and it was really, you know, freaking people out. And then you develop like sort of like um, skillful sort of, uh, this mean skillful means in Buddhism. That's what it's called where you're able to just meet people where they're at. Like an example, I'm a big sports fan. I'm in the Pacific Northwest. I'm a huge Seahawks fan. And I, you know, I can watch a football game with anybody and incredibly connect. So, you know, you're just able to connect with people wherever they're at. And I see my teachers, these great, you know, spiritual teachers. And if they're with an incredibly advanced practitioner, they're able to like, you know, to speak to them at that level. And if they're with somebody who's never heard about spirituality or Buddhism or meditation, they're able to completely just shapeshift and be really authentic with that person who's the beginner. And so, you know, it's really, it's a cool thing to be able to, um, you know, just be able to be in the world in a way, but not of the world and not get, you know, just to play whatever role that you're being cast in, you know, um, at the, in the moment, but to not be identified with the role and be fluid. That's, that's just a really cool thing. Gotcha. 
Yeah, I'm with you on that too. Um, it it sounds easy though, right? But yeah, I get, I'll I'll try better at it. I do really like when I go out into public. I think, okay, I'm not going to get polar. I'm going to be real objective. I'm going to look at everything. But it's I swear on everything, Paul. It's almost like when you get that way, then the polarized, let's just say energy, because I don't want to say people, but the polarized energy doesn't like it, and it wants to drag you into an argument. You know you know what I'm saying? Like, why aren't you arguing? Yeah, I totally know what you're saying, but then you, you know, as you become more sort of stabilized in, in your awareness, you're able to not take the bait and to not get hooked. You know, you, you can be triggered, but then, you know, instead of acting out and indulging in the trigger and acting out your, you know, reactivity, you're able to reflect on, oh, wow, what in me is being triggered right now? It's an mm-hmm. incredible opportunity to self-reflect. And that's actually a practice that, you know, we can all do that can be incredibly helpful. There's a question in the Fringe FM chat from Craven that says, does Paul have any experience with dream yoga or the practice of illusory form? Just wondering how he thinks of dreams and how that relates to his view of reality as a dream. uh, No, that's, I appreciate that question. And so when I got out of that last hospital in 82, I began having the most, these dreams, the most unbelievable dreams night after night after night. And, you know, I wasn't connected with my dreams. Um, and, um, so I knew, oh my God, I have to like learn, like, what do I do with this and how do I understand this? And so I began studying dreams and, and reading about them and keeping a dream journal. I mean, thousands and thousands of dreams in my dream journal over years and years and years to the point where, you know, I became incredibly connected with my dreams. And then I began having these, these lucid dreams where I would, you know, be in the night dream, not knowing I was dreaming, and then something would happen, and I would realize I was dreaming, and I would have a lucid dream. And that was mind-blowing. That was mind-blowing to me, and that mapped on to the experience that I was having in the awakening in 81, in the same way that I was having the awareness in the night dream that I was dreaming. That's a way of really describing my experience in 1981 when I say, oh, I was beginning to realize that we are having a collectively shared dream, and I was beginning to wake up to that. And um, and the thing which is interesting, um, the word um, Buddha, it literally means um, he who has awakened to the dreamlike nature. That's the meaning of the word. And so when I was having these lucid dreams, um, and the very first one that I began that I had. I was such a beginner at Buddhist practice. I wasn't even doing that. I I began as soon as I had the moment of become of having lucidity, I began chanting the mantra of compassion. Om Mani Pemi Hung. It was like it was chanting itself through me. And I was such a beginner at Buddhist practice. I was, I wasn't even doing, I didn't even know that practice. I was still first, you know, just meditating and not even doing any, any mantras. I think I, and, you know, and, and then every time that I would have a, a lucid dream, I would spontaneously, like a knee-jerk reaction, just start chanting, Om Mani Pemi Hung. And that's the mantra of compassion. And I didn't understand at that point that in Buddhism, they talk about awakening is always the combination of two factors, of emptiness and compassion. And emptiness, that's lucidity. That's recognizing there's no independent, intrinsic, objective existence to the universe you're in. That's the emptiness. But they say in Buddhism that if it's a real awakening, it's always emptiness co-joined with compassion. Om Mani Pemi Hung is the mantra of compassion. So it was really interesting to me that when I was having the realization of emptiness, the very thing that the core of my the core of my being would do would start, you know, just expressing and saying the mantra of compassion. So, yeah, like doing a dream yoga is a major part of my practice and I do it all day. I go about my whole day just imagining this is a practice in Tibetan Buddhism of imagining that this is a dream. And if it's a dream, Om Mani Pemi Hung, let me cultivate the open heart of compassion. Gotcha. Very cool. Very cool. So now the book that you wrote, The Quantum Revelation, is this, are you trying to, see, because I'm trying to, understand you know the quantum realm quantum entanglement stuff like that uh it does get a little um perplexing when you start looking at it all 
But in my mind, Paul, it's like the scientists, I feel, are going to keep spinning their wheels until they just embrace consciousness. I feel like at some point they're going to have to throw their hands up and go, okay, we're going to have to look at consciousness to figure out what, you know, quote, dark matter is or what's on the other side of the black hole or et cetera. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Well, well, I mean, I totally know what you mean because in quantum physics, consciousness has intruded itself into the physics lab and it's not going away. And this is not what your typical academic corporate physicist has signed up for. And so consciousness has to be factored into the equation of the universe. There's no getting around that. And the real, you know, cutting edge uh, physicists, uh, the founding fathers, are are absolutely saying that. They're saying basically that, okay, for example, quantum physics has already changed the course of history with all the technology. It's considered to be the greatest discovery ever in all of history in the realm of science. That there's no debate about. What there's a debate about is what does it mean? So quantum physics has already changed the course of history. Think of all the technologies with computers, for example. That's like, you know, just such a, there's so many fields that quantum oh, yeah. physics informed but the quantum physicists the real cutting edge ones are saying that's the low hanging fruit that's less than one percent of the benefit of quantum physics quantum physics real benefit is going to be inside of our mind that quantum physics is going to expand our consciousness because it's showing us the primacy of consciousness in the actual in the universe and there's no getting away from that like i was saying with the double slit experiment is that you know quantum physics is basically saying we as observers are influencing the universe that we're observing there's no separate objective universe that's major that is such a rabbit hole to go down because when you realize there's no objective universe what happened to the subject we as a subject need an object to be in relationship with or we can't be a subject when all of a sudden we discover there's no such thing as an object there's no such thing as separate things. There is nothing objective. It all of a sudden puts into question, wait a second, who am I? Who's the subject? See, that's where quantum physics promotes itself to become a spiritual path because it's literally flooding light when you look at it in a certain way on our nature because quantum physics was trying to find what is the building blocks of this universe and in trying to find the microstructure, the very micro building blocks of this universe what it found was mind what it found was consciousness it couldn't find anything that was made of matter okay and um you know it, it it's so it's such a radical it's only been a hundred years that it's that it's been discovered or or created uh, however you depending on how you talk about it and we're in the beginning stages of first being able to understand what it's showing us. Because what it is showing us, I want to make this clear, is that we're having a dream. This isn't like a dream. This is a collectively shared dream. And when more and more, like I was saying before, if you hold a viewpoint in the dream, the dream will has no choice but to offer you all the evidence confirming your viewpoint. Then you get fixed in your viewpoint. It's a feedback loop whose origin is your own mind. Quantum physics is showing us that. It's showing us the dreamlike nature, and when you recognize that, you recognize the act of us observing the universe moment by moment is creative. We're co-creating the universe, and quantum physics is a revelation showing us that. And when you realize that, all of a sudden it expands the realm of potentiality to unimaginable degrees. What we thought of as impossible all of a sudden expands to the point where is anything impossible? That becomes a real question. Yeah, time and time again, I've thought, I wonder just what we're holding back on our potential because, uh, you know, Rupert Sheldrake has already shown us, and humans, uh, just in history, have already shown us, like, we have these barriers, and it's uh, we've brought this up so many times, but I think it's so important, you know, like, we've got these barriers that we think we cannot do this. Uh, we can't run, uh, you know, 1,100 meters in three seconds flat or four seconds just until somebody does it. Then once that one person breaks that barrier, then it's like everybody catches up across the planet, even if they don't even know what happened or that the record was broken. Humanity catches up. Isn't yeah, that weird? It's showing that it's it's like you see. Okay, here's a very simple way of understanding quantum physics. You have a quantum entity, right, which exists 
just in a state of, of open-ended potentiality, which is to say it exists in every and any state it could possibly exist in. And then once it's observed, all of those potentialities vaporize into one particular actualized state. And all the, those potential states, they are like, they, it's like they no longer exist. And then we actually have whatever, you know, whatever state became actualized. But the point being is that quantum physics is saying, even if something, and this is a quote, is highly ridiculously unlikely. So if one of those potential states is highly ridiculously unlikely, an example being, what if humanity actually wakes up? collectively, even though that is highly ridiculously unlikely, quantum physics is saying, oh, that could be this very moment. That is in the realm of the possible. And, it, and if we're not thinking that, then what are we thinking? Then we're having limited thinking where we're saying, oh, no, that's not possible that humanity could wake up. And then we are part of the problem because then by holding that pessimistic viewpoint, we're going to invoke a universe that's going to support and serve as evidence confirming our pessimistic viewpoint, mm. which then convinces us that we're just in touch with reality, that we're seeing the truth. So we become even more entranced in that viewpoint. There's that feedback loop again. But quantum physics comes along. And what I'm saying is that when you look at it in this way, it's actually showing us the incredible potential that is like just waiting to be actualized this unbelievably creative power that we have to dream up our world. And what I'm presenting in my work is that there is a way of us being together where instead of projecting the shadow on each other, which is really to be like placing a curse on each other, but there is a way of dreaming each other up where we actually dream ourselves awake. And this is a real conspiracy theory. We can conspire to co-inspire each other. We can literally dream ourselves awake. This is what quantum physics is showing us. And this is for us to realize we can participate in our own evolution. That's wow. what it's all about. Okay. Um, yeah. Wow. Okay. Uh, let's see. Before, before we take our news break again, let's go ahead and take this phone call here. This is 256 area code. You're on the air with Paul Levy, who he's speaking with. Up and they hung up, so I guess we're going to take a break. That must have scared them. Uh, if you want to call back in, if something happened, it's 1 800 588 0335. We'll be right back with Paul Levy. Stay with us. Thanks for listening to this broadcast. Need another late night fix? You can tune in every weeknight to Lighting the Void with Joe Roop on The Fringe FM. Hi, this is David Oman with House at the End of the Drive.com. You're listening to KTLK, The Fringe FM. I like to listen to Lighting the Void because of the guests, the content, and the host, Joe Roop. He's smart, he's intelligent, and he seems to ask the questions that we all have on our mind. We're all searching for the truth, and Joe helps us get closer to it. I love this show. I love this show. I love this show. Light in the Void. What's up, Joe? Hey, man, I just wanted to say your show, dude, keeps getting better and better and better. I love Lighting the Void and the Fringe FM. Hi, this is Aaron Hunter, host of Real Paranormal Activity, the podcast where we tell real paranormal experiences of people from around the world. And we also conduct interviews with authors, investigators, psychics, and mediums. Real people, real stories, real fear. Thursdays at 6 p.m. Pacific, 9 p.m. Eastern on The Fringe FM. See you then. 
Repair Abnormal News, I'm Brad Bernards. A four-armed robotic junk collector will be launched into space by the European Space Agency in what it says will be the first mission to remove an item of debris from orbit. The Clear Space One mission is scheduled for launch in 2025, but the agency hopes the mission will pave the way for a wide-reaching clear-up operation, with ESA's Director General calling for new rules that would compel those who launch satellites to take responsibility for removing them from orbit once they are retired from use. Here's Project Manager Muriel Richard Noka. We will launch to an orbit of about 500 km altitude, make sure that all the systems are functioning, and then we'll do a burn that will bring us to the height of this cube. We'll get close enough to take a picture of it, make sure that we're not capturing something else, and then we'll do the capture. In the past 60 years, thousands of tons of junk has accumulated around the Earth, including old rocket parts, about 3,500 defunct satellites, and an estimated 750,000 smaller fragments, some from collisions between larger bits of junk. The fragments are typically circulating with a velocity of 12,500 miles per hour. Unless a clear-up operation is mounted, the chances of collisions will escalate as thousands more satellites are put into orbit. For the last year, NASA's OSIRIS-REx spacecraft has been circling a large asteroid named Bennu that regularly passes uncomfortably close to Earth. The spacecraft has been painstakingly mapping the asteroid's rocky surface using a suite of cameras and other instruments that will help it determine where to land next year. Once NASA selects a final landing site, OSIRIS-REx will kiss Bennu just long enough to scoop up a sample to bring back to Earth in 2023. Many scientists expect the Bennu sample to revolutionize our understanding of asteroids, especially those that are near Earth and pose the greatest threat from space to life as we know it. Earlier this year, the OSIRIS-REx team witnessed particles exploding from the asteroid surface, and it's not sure why. Read more about tonight's news at ParaAbnormalRadio.com. I'm Brad Bernards, ParaAbnormal News. Hey, this check is wrong. I worked a holiday and seven hours of overtime. Not getting paid correctly is a real pain. It could also hurt our boss if our company provides out of compliance checks. That's right, construction companies doing business with the government can get fined or officials of the companies can go to jail if the checks aren't right. It's a law. The Davis-Bacon Act has 30 compliance issues for every check, but there is an easy way for construction companies to be in compliance. EMARS offers Compliant Client, a web-based system that finds and corrects all 30 of the possible out-of-compliance check issues. Users of Compliant Client report an 80% savings in time and money. Running a weekly payroll usually takes about five minutes. All 15,000 plus clients of EMARS have never had a legal compliance issue. Plus, they sleep better on check day. Contact EMARS at emarsinc.com or call 480-595-0466. Do you want to know the truth? Are UFOs real? Are aliens visiting Earth? Are governments around the world hiding the biggest secret in history? We're UFO Seekers, official partner of The Fringe FM, and we're on a hunt for the truth. Join us as we investigate locations like Area 51 by subscribing on YouTube at youtube.com slash UFO Seekers. You know, stress is at an all-time high, and all of us could use a little bit of stress relief. That's why I want to talk to you about Soothe. Now, this is an app you can download on your phone. They have a massage therapist that arrives with a massage table, sheets, lotion, oils, and music, and you're in charge. You can book in seconds and schedule at 8 a.m. to midnight. Massage seven days a week, anytime it's available. There's a 60-minute arrival period. A vetted background-checked massage therapist will come to you in as little as an hour. All of the therapists are vetted by industry veterans that ensure a compassionate healing touch. So maybe you're a little stressed and you need to feel spoiled. Well... There's no better way to do that than relax at your own home and not have to deal with the outside world with Soothe. Right now, you can get $10 off your first massage by putting in the code word FRINGE10 at checkout. That's www.soothe.com or download the Soothe app and put in the code word FRINGE10. Alex X. Hi, I'm Alex Exum, and you're listening to The Fringe FM. You're listening to Lighting the Void. 
The call-in number is 1-800-588-0335. If you would like to text, you can text in at 501-777-5631. Paul Levy is our guest tonight. The website is awakeninthedream.com. Don't forget this show is here for you five nights a week. Monday through Friday night, 9 p.m. Pacific to midnight this week. And then the next week, we're going to be on a hiatus, or at least I am. Uh, but if you want to, because um, we're going to be reevaluating the station and stuff. So, look, if you want to be a guest host, send in your demo to producer at thefringe.fm, and you can host the show. We've already gotten a few um, because i got to take a break, and i got to look at the station and the show because we're going to keep just – adding it up man keep ramping it up that's what we're going to do here so don't think that i'm running away what we're doing is we're going to the drawing board to try to figure out how to make it bigger all right so back with what we were discussing with paul and again the website is awakeninthedream.com i've got a text in here for you paul and this is something to speculate about based on what you were saying uh about how we're creating things um there's a text in from uh i think it's pacho here that says is memory created and, you know, and I texted him back when they asked that question. I said, well, could you evaluate based, what are you saying based on what Paul's saying? He said, well, are we creating these memories and then recreating them instead of actually retrieving and remembering them from somewhere because of what you were stating earlier about how we're kind of perpetuating this illusion, this dream? Yeah, well, no, that's a really interesting question. Say, for example, if, if you and I, have a particular shared experience in this moment, right? And then, like in the future, we contemplate, you know, what is, yeah, you know, we each have a memory of what happened. Well, I'm going to be, I might be interpreting what happened in a totally different way than you're interpreting what happened. But we both had like this, uh, this shared experience, but we're interpreting it through the filter of, you know, our mind and of our wounds and trauma or you know however we're placing this whatever like the meaning onto the experience but it's not we're going to be doing it based on our own inner process and so and then based on how we remember the shared experience we're then going to be in that moment that we're having the memory we're going to be creating our present moment experience based on how we're choosing to interpret and to place the meaning on our this shared experience. So there, it's just another example that there's nothing that's actually like written in stone. And, um, and it, it makes me think of, you know, shamans, it, it, it said they can go back into the past and in a way like, you know, rewrite the past. This kind of has to do with that. They, they, they sort of tell a different story about what happened. Now, interestingly, in quantum physics, they'll talk about, they've discovered through a variation of the double slit experiment that the way we actually interpret the past, by all accounts, see what it has, it affects what we can say about the past. As if in this present moment, when we remember the past, it's as if we're having an effect on something that's already happened. And that's not sci-fi. That's hardcore quantum physics. Now, to even take it the next step, quantum physics is saying this universe is like, like this rainbow. Now, think about what a rainbow is. A rainbow is a combination of three factors. There's light, there's water, and there's a mind. There's no objective rainbow out there. If any of those three factors aren't present, there's no rainbow. A rainbow is simply an image in our mind. Quantum physics is saying this universe is like a rainbow okay, that it doesn't exist objectively, that mind is a key factor in the equation of our experience of the universe. And not only that, quantum physics is then saying that if you and I are seeing a rainbow, we're not seeing the same rainbow. We're each seeing our own private rainbow. Think about it. We're seeing it from a different angle. Hmm. And quantum physics is saying, yeah, there's no objective universe that we're all sharing. We're each dreaming up our own universe. And, and we can share it and have certain, you know, language uh, to create like a shared experience. 
but we're really the the sovereign agent who's creating our own experience. And the thing which is so amazing is that people and nations go to war and a lot of it is based on whose version of reality is actually true. And, you know, quantum physics is saying, but that's a ridiculous notion. There, There's not even, so it's not just like, oh, there's something out there and we're all seeing it through our own subjective lens. Quantum physics is saying, no, there's not actually anything. There's something out there. It's just not objective in the way we've been entrained to think of it as being objective. Okay. So that would be the way I would answer that question. You know, that could, that could kind of goes along with what uh, some other guests we've had on that talk about, uh, you know, they talk about dimensions and stuff and they say, well, we've got all these different multiple dimensions and stuff that are actually permeating on top of this reality where we look at re- other places as well. That's way out there. Alpha Centauri, that's separate or whatever. But really, there's just this like perpetuating thing based on frequency. That's what they say, that it's all on top of each other. Now, if that's true, if it's frequency, you know, Joe Dispenza also writes about this, like we broadcast our own frequencies with our thoughts and emotions, then we can, I mean, you're right. We could literally just change our reality as we go along. And the more that we agree and the more we all come to realize this, the faster we could do it, right? Yeah. And the thing is, there's a couple things about that, because in a dream, if, if you're just the one dreamer in a night dream, if you change your viewpoint, like I was saying, the dream, you know, has no choice but to instantaneously shape shift. But in the waking dream, if you change your viewpoint, it's more solid in the sense that you're just one of billions, seven and a half billion humans and all other sentient species are co-dreaming together. So if you just change your viewpoint, it's not necessarily going to get instantaneously reflected in the waking dream. But when sufficient number of people change their viewpoint or, or what I what I call like getting in touch with with the sacred power of dreaming, the part of us that's dreaming this universe into materialization, uh, like a way to understand this in a night dream. If you have lucidity and your dream character, the dream ego has lucidity. And then there are other of the dream characters, parts of yourself that are also becoming lucid and you all hang out and connect with each other and contemplate what you're realizing. You discover, oh, my God, this dream universe that we're inhabiting is we're dreaming it. We're actually it's a function of our sacred power of dreaming, which means when we realize that we can actually get in phase with each other and we can literally change the dream that we're having. That's what I was talking about before, about consciously participating in our own evolution that's what's being offered to us okay now if i could just say one more profoundly like trippy and amazing thing in tibetan buddhism there's a phenomena called terma now terma it actually translates as the hidden treasures and there's a lineage and I, this the lineage i do practice to where the the tradition itself continually refreshes itself and keeps itself pure by these revelations by these hidden treasures that are planted in the fabric of the universe. And then the person who's destined to discover the treasure will discover it. And it's exactly the very teaching or the practice or the prayer that's needed to get the practitioners back, you know, to remember who they are. And it's very much like a symbol in a dream, you know, the unconscious, it's compensatory. When we get one-sided and when we fall asleep, the unconscious through symbols will send us particular symbols that will help us get back in balance. These hidden treasures, these terma, are are like those symbols. Now, quantum physics is a symbolic procedure. What I just gave a big lecture about and, um, and, and did an article on is that quantum physics can be seen to be a modern-day analog to a terma, to a hidden treasure. In other words, we as a species have dreamed up quantum physics into the world and into our minds to help us to wake up, to help us to remember who we are, to help us to recognize the dreamlike nature, and to help us to unlock the incredible creative power that all of us have, but almost all of us are, are wielding it unconsciously. So that's a major thing when you actually recognize that quantum physics in a way is a modern day analog to a terma, to a hidden treasure, And like I point out in my talk, it's actually, or in my article, it's actually the, the good news. It's the, it's the philosopher's stone. It's the Holy grail. It's the pearl of great price. 
on and on, all the different metaphors. It's the second coming, and it's already here. But it needs what quantum physics is pointing at is that this is a participatory universe. It needs our participation. We need to recognize what's being revealed in order to receive the benefit. Hmm. Wow. So why then? And we're in the stage of 2020, right? Well, let me ask you this before I ask this question. Do you yourself uh, subscribe to like destiny? Like things are going to, there's this end game that's going to happen no matter what. It's just a matter of when. Well, yeah, I would, I would say quantum physics has absolutely empirically proven um, that that's BS, that there is, they, you know, physicists before quantum physics thought if you had enough information, you could figure out how that it was a deterministic universe and you could figure out how things were going to end up. And quantum physics has, has like, you know, um, shed light on that illusion and realized empirically proven beyond the slightest shadow of a doubt that that's not true. And that, you know, that this universe at each and every moment exists in a state of potential. And it's a function of how we dream it, that we are the responsible agents. We are the dreamers of the dream. And, um, so to say that there's an endpoint and there's, you know, it, it, it's definite that that's completely quantum physics would say that that's a completely mistaken idea. And any Western tradition would say that that's, that's just not, it's just, it's just wrong, you know? And, um, yeah, so I don't, I can go on, but I think you get my drift. Yeah. Well, see, the reason why I ask that is I was telling you on the break that I went on ground zero with Clyde Lewis and what we were talking about with Ryan Gable was, okay, there was the Lincoln assassination and then there was the JFK assassination. Now here's the weird thing about both stories. There are a lot of characters, street names, uh, you name it, right. that were all yeah, kind of yeah. mixed up, but were still there almost as if it was quantum entangled sent right. out, came back and retold in a different way. So there's this book Ecclesiastes that says, you know, there's nothing new under the sun. So sometimes I wonder if there is some type of, of reoccurring narrative that is kind well, of entangled. But that's true in the sense that it's like a recurring dream. That's the whole idea of synchronistic phenomena where, you know, what quantum physics is showing is that by consciousness entering the physics lab, that matter is not separate from mind. And that's what happens when you begin to have these synchronistic experiences that all of a sudden, whatever is going on inside of your psyche is getting embodied and reflected and expressed via the medium of the outside world. That matter and mind are actually not separate. And that's just showing that, yeah, this universe in a way is embedded in a higher dimensional reality that is not separate from mind. You know, like quantum physics has shown they've actually, it was so amazing when I discovered this in the, in my, in, you know, my studies, they were saying, yeah, quantum physics has shown there's no such thing as matter. Like matter doesn't exist any longer, you know, from the point of view of how we envisioned it before the advent of quantum physics, you know, but it is like a recurring dream in that something is being shown to us. Something is actually revealing itself. And just like a dream, if you don't get the message, you're going to have a recurring dream. It's going to recreate itself in more and more amplified form until you get the message, you know, and then you integrate whatever the message is. But if you don't get the message in a dream, definitely it's going to reiterate itself. It's going to repeat and recreate itself. That makes so much sense. Even if I think about my dream journal right now, as you're saying, that's giving me chills because I've had the reoccurring dreams of things that happen, but they happen in different amplifications. It's almost like, Hey, you're, you're not listening. So I'm going to try this to see if we can get my point across this way. So, so is there something else trying to speak to us? It does seem like that, right? Is it our higher self, some kind of holy guardian angel? What is yeah, that? Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Well, an angel is a messenger. Remember I said, if you don't get the message and the idea being this universe is a revelation, it's a living revelation. This universe is an Oracle and, um, you know, and we just have to get in phase and, and like sort of decode. It's like a cipher of information that we need to decipher. We need to decode it and, um, you know, just have the recognition. It's just like a dream. You know, you have a dream and a dream is actually like the unconscious that is actually through the symbols in a dream, which are the language of the dream, are trying to communicate with a part of you. And, and what I'm saying is that this being a dream is exactly like that. That's why Jung, he spent his entire life fighting 
for the reactivation of symbolic awareness. And what symbolic awareness is, is you recognize this is dreamlike. And just like a dream is speaking symbolically, you recognize that, oh my God, all throughout my day, the universe is an oracle. It's a living revelation. And I can interpret it not in a literal way, but symbolically, and Christ himself in my new book that's coming out you know, when it gets published, I talk about that in the apocryphal text, Christ himself was teaching his disciples to understand the Christ event symbolically. Mm, yeah, right. right. You know, not literally. If you, if you interpret Christ literally, that's completely the opposite of how Christ himself wanted you to interpret the whole Christ event. And I mean, it's just so mind blowing how. I mean, didn't our- Paul say that? Like, be not a study of the letter, or something like that, where he was trying to get you to either Paul or Peter. I forget who said that, but yeah, I I'm see not, what you're saying. In the apocryphal text, like he appears to John, and John then says, "If there's one thing I know to be true, is that you know the Lord created everything as a dispensation for humanity, um, as a living symbol." And you know, I'm paraphrasing, but that that the Lord contrived all things symbolically, you know, for our for us. And, um, you know, and, and there's an actual experience where Christ appeared to John in the apocryphal text in a cross of light as he's being crucified. And he's saying, people down there on the cross think that that's me. No, that's not me. This is me, you know, and here he's in a, in a cross of light filled with light. And he just, that's when he gives John this mystic transmission of to see what came through him symbolically. And that got written out of the Bible. Wow. Yeah, that's that's so true, man. That's so okay. Now then I'm looking at that, I'm thinking when we interpret that, if we really get into the etymology of the words and stuff and that means logos, then in the beginning there was logos or symbolism and God was symbolism. It's almost like, hey, in the beginning there was consciousness that communicated through symbolism and then it created this place. That's the way I look at it, right? I mean, if you want to look at it in a different way, that's fine, but I get what it's saying now. But if that's the case, then we can literally take, or what are your thoughts on taking our dreams, like Carl Jung talks about, and working with our dreams to actually manifest, and I'm talking about your sleeping dreams, to actually manifest stuff into your physical life or vice versa, right? You think that that works, right? Well, the thing is, I mean, the thing about our dreams, they're like these gifts that we're being given every night and, but they're not enough just to have the dream, the idea of really, you know, writing it down and, and, you know, to try to understand what, what the dream is showing us. Because like I was saying before, if you don't really get the message and keep in mind, the dream is, is, you know, speaking symbolically and symbols are different than signs, which are literal, like one way do not enter that has this literal meaning, that's a sign. Symbols are emanations of a deeper mystery and and they're actually a portal and they're bringing you to that deeper mystery that they themselves are reflecting. So they're they're not like, they're very different than a literal sign. And when you get in phase with a symbol, it transforms psychic energy. It, it it, It will give this liberation for like stuck energy where all of a sudden something in you begins to move and you begin to, you know, just something in you transforms. They're psychic energy transformers. That's what a symbol is. Gotcha. So then fundamentally, our biggest problem is if all of this is true, which I believe it is, then our, one of our biggest problems is, is our focus on the material world then. Materialism itself, right? Oh, totally. I mean, well, that's where, that's where when you think about like quantum physics as a dreaming process, that we literally dreamed it up as a terma, as a hidden treasure. Well, think about it. You have to have context for that. Before quantum physics, there was classical physics, which was just materialistic. Just this, this, you know, it was always scientific materialism, just thinking that the reality was matter. And, and then, of course, what Tico feeds into that, because what Tico is, is all about consumption. And just, you know, becoming wealth and, and money and all that stuff. And it's all having to do with, with material stuff. And that feeds into the collective psychosis. So then quantum physics is a compensation that emerged into the world and into our minds uh, to sort of to get more us more in balance and out of the materialistic point of view. And that's the point of view that's actually killing us. Wow. Yeah, that is. Uh, yeah, so... 
and it's funny too because when you look into like alchemy some of these alchemists are just trying to extend their life and even some of them talk about everlasting life or immortality but there is this whole idea of extending a extending your time on earth so that you can experience more of this reality and when i say this reality i mean what you're talking about the true the trueness of what's really going on here you know yeah but the thing about the alchemists the real the real awake alchemists they realized they weren't talking about immortality physically and they weren't talking about making physical gold to be, uh, make wealth they that the gold the real alchemical gold was the awakened state that's what the you know and and the thing about alchemy is that the alchemists they were actually projecting their unconscious into the flask into the hermetic vessel and and then thinking that it was actually it, it was a quality that it adhered that actually was intrinsic to the matter in the vessel without realizing no they were just dreaming they were seeing their own unconscious psyche and the ones who were like actually the awake alchemists were realizing that they were realizing oh my god i'm dreaming i'm projecting onto the ink blot and i'm seeing my own psyche that's to begin to wake up wow that's some pretty deep stuff man well it's because i can't so right now as you and i are talking well i've been in a dream before you know and you when you know you're in a dream you become lucid and you say okay i want to wake up and if you try to wake yourself up some people you know they'll kill themselves in the dream i've actually woke myself up before and felt my eyes shaking so hard because i'm trying to wake up from this deep uh tense state or whatever my body's in if that's the case okay and we can do that in that form then how come we can't just snap our fingers right now and wake up or can we yeah, well, that that's an interesting question. I mean, I don't want to cast any spells, but the, <laughs> right. like, like you know. And the thing is, it's an individual, like the awakening. It, you know, it has to happen in an individual. But you know, in the same way, in a dream, it's not that hard to have to have have lucidity in a dream. But then it's very seductive to get absorbed back in the in the forms of the dream and forget that you're dreaming. And the same way here, we can have this awakening. But then it's very easy to get absorbed. And I don't want to even cast a spell with my words. Um, and how do you make a word? You spell it. But it can be easy to get absorbed and forget that you're dreaming. The idea being to stabilize that lucidity and to connect with other people who also have that lucidity. That's the idea of Sangha, of community in Buddhism. When you hang out with other people who are awakening, we can all, like I was saying before, conspire to co-inspire each other. We can, we can dream ourselves awake. And we can actually like help each other to awaken. If I help you, it helps me because we're not separate. It's not a competitive sport. That's the idea of spiritual community. And that's really what's so needed in this day and age. Mm, I got you. Sangha. Well, I can definitely tell you, some of our listeners, uh, we probably have that here right now with the Void Walkers that listen to this show. A little bit of Sangha. Paul Levy's our guest tonight. If you got any questions, you can go into the Fringe FM chat, text in or call in 1-800-588-0335. We'll be right back after these messages. to the Fringe FM. This is all. I listen to Lighting the Void because it's interactive radio with good content, interesting guests, and a humble host sharing his journey through the esoteric. Hey, Joe Roop. Thanks for having us along for the ride. Thank you so much for the delightful evening. Well, I got a lot of ground to cover. listening to the fringe fm hey i'm jm to board and when i want to talk about dreams i look up my man joe root and his show lighting the void 
The Fringe FM isn't just a radio station. We also provide services for all your audio production needs. If you are interested in live radio or pre-recorded podcasts, we're here to help. We even do audio enhancements and voiceovers if needed. If you want to do a podcast or a live radio show and even want the option to syndicate on terrestrial radio from simple audio file enhancement to live production and call screening, we have you covered. We have worked with some of the best professionals in the business in order to provide coaching instruction for content creation, show structure, and more. Contact The Fringe Digital Media for more at info at thefringe.fm. That's info at thefringe.fm. Or call 501-777-5631 for a consultation. Listen, I want to tell you about G.I. Joy from GetTheTea.com. It's the best alchemical concoction of goodies for your stomach and digestive system I can recommend, and that's all based on my experience. Packed with colostrum, acidophilus, aloe, peppermint, and turmeric. If you do your own research, then you know this is the bee's knees for the stomach and digestion. Now, due to Big Brother's ears and the eye in the sky, you know I can't go into the details about what it helped me with. All I can say is, I got relief. It's non-GMO, no fillers, no preservatives, manufactured right here in the U.S. of A., and delivered to you by the only people who stay on top of the game and are out in front. Go grab a bottle of G.I. Joy at GetTheTea.com and see what all the fuss is about. Again, that's GetTheTea.com. Hi, this is Sammy. Join us in the Deep South as we're lighting the void with Joe Roop on the Fringe FM. Yuck, they're unhealthy and gross. Bugs, I hate bugs. We keep a clean home, but occasionally bugs show up. Well, I found something that is tougher than bugs. Orange Guard. From contact, it kills bugs. Plus, Orange Guard kills hidden bugs and keeps new bugs away for weeks. I know, I use Orange Guard. Plus, all of the ingredients of Orange Guard are on the FDA generally regarded as safe list. Orange Guard may be used around food, humans, and pets. It promotes a healthier planet, and here's a bonus. Orange Guard cleans where it's sprayed. Plus, it comes with a 30-day money-back guarantee. Orange Guard. You can get Orange Guard at Ace Hardware. And listen, folks, Orange Guard is tougher than bugs, and it's safe to use. Go to orangeguard.com. That's orangeguard.com. Right, me old Chinas. I know it's an ad break, but before you lot shoot off and make yourself a cup of Rosie Lee or whatever else it is you're going to sling down your Gregory Peck, you need to listen to me bubble. If, like me, you found your way to lighten the void via a downloadable podcast, you might want to take a butcher's at the Fringe FM Wind and Kite. You won't, Adam and Eve, how many other shows there are or what they rabbit on about. Ancient history, conspiracy, the consciousness, the esoteric, the occult, metaphysics, parapolitical, ufology, technology and spirituality to name but a few. They got featured hosts like Ryan Gable, Jeremy Scott, Alex Exum, Tim Doyle, Cortana and Gigi, Susanna Ross, the Reverend John Polk, Michael Deacon and J.D. Lewis. You might find yourself listening to the thoughts and theories of the author of The Fish You Just Finished Reading. Or you could pick up the dog and bone, call in and tell everyone your own beliefs or experiences. So do me a favour. Before you put on the ansel or crack open a bottle of vino or roll a joint, Go to the Fringe FM and see what you're missing. Are you intrigued by Paranormal Talk Radio? You'll love the new Paranormal Radio app from TalkStream Live. You'll find a great selection of talk shows covering UFOs, ghosts, strange phenomena, and much more. Download the Paranormal Radio app now and start listening to the very best in Paranormal Talk entertainment, including the network you're listening to right now. The Paranormal Radio app, free in Google Play and the iOS App Store. Levy, our guest tonight, and this conversation went just as deep as I thought it was going to go. 
If you want to call in, it's 1-800-588-0335. There's also a direct line at 501-424-5130. You can listen to the show via the Talk Stream Live app, the Paranormal Radio app, or you can also use the Fringe FM app if you want to. There's even Alexa. You just have to download the skill. And uh, there's a call-in line, too. Not a call-in line, but a listen line, 701-719-3971. And you can catch all these shows for free on our archives, any podcast player or YouTube. You know, I had a thought during the break, Paul, about um, where we get frustrated because, like I said, you know, to you during the break, we could talk about this stuff forever and ever and ever. But what we want to get is we want to get to the state where we can actually effectively see changes and effectively explore consciousness in ways that can only be imagined, right? And I feel like where we're spinning our circles is is because we can't get others to see this sometimes. And it's like, yeah, I know I've got to do this individual awakening thing. I know that's my responsibility, but it sure would be easier if we could just convince everybody to tag along because it would create a perpetuating reality of alternate consciousness where we could see everything, right? It would create this much easier place where we could explore these things better. But the problem is this polarity once again. And that's, and that's, True, except good luck with trying to convince anybody of anything, because, you know, I think we probably all have had the experience of when you're trying to convince somebody of something that you're seeing, you know, if they don't see it, you know, so they have a blind spot. And it's like you're preaching the light to somebody whose eyes are blind, you know, and if you're doing that, who's the one who's really blind? It's you, you know, and the idea being is that... Young points out, instead of preaching the light to somebody whose eyes are blind, what about teaching people the art of seeing? In other words, teaching them how to see. And and that's really interesting. Um, You know, and so it's a really, it's a challenge how best when we've really integrated to whatever degree, because we're all a work in, in progress, in process, you know, to whatever degree we, we've integrated this understanding, um, how to transmit that. And, and one of the best ways I think is to really just to embody it, to be it, to live it. Because like I was saying before, when you have the realization of the dreamlike nature of reality, you discover that we're not separate and you see through the illusion of the separate self. And, um, and when you have lucidity, the energetic expression of that is compassion. So if you're able to actually embody being an open-hearted, compassionate person, that in a way is you being like the best sort of like this representative or agent of the very thing you're wanting to convince somebody of. Because from that point of view, you're bypassing the conscious mind and you're talking in a direct way to the other person's unconscious, you know, and that can really have an effect. Yeah. So... Yeah, it does. And do you think that your so tell me actually, well, because I know that you're only here with us for a few minutes and and we can go round and round talking about this stuff, but I've got quite a few listeners from the Pacific Northwest. What do you got going on up there? Tell me about what you, your teachings and your classes and stuff. Yeah, yeah. So so I'm in Portland and um I'm really lucky in that I have a whole community um, that's formed around my work. And I have all these groups. I have three groups every week, you know, maybe about 12 people in each group. And so every Tuesday night, I have the same people every Wednesday night, every Thursday night. And then once a month, I have a monthly group. And, and there are some people in the groups over 20 years, some of the groups, the average tenure might be over 10 years of each person. And they're all like healers and therapists and shamans and just people who really are doing the work you know, on themselves and they're very spiritually connected. And we've discovered that there's a way of just hanging out, just being present with each other without any agenda, but just being, you know, present in the moment. And the main channel we work with is just the relationship channel. It's just being really interested in who we are and interacting that, um, people's stuff, when you feel safe, people can tell us about their process oh, my father did this, my mother did that, and all that, that's that's okay. But their process, their unconscious process, will literally at a certain point get dreamed into the room and play itself out. And that's what we're always doing anyway. 
we're always projecting onto the inkblot of waking life in such a way that we're like reiterating our unconscious trauma. But almost everyone's doing that, you know, unconsciously, not in a container. Well, the groups that I've um, facilitate are, in a way, we were talking about alchemy. They're a, um, this alchemical container, and um, so we, you know, we'll get into conflict, but which is great. Instead of like, so many of us have experiences of like, oh, conflict creates hurt and separation and misunderstanding. Well, there's a way of going into conflict, you know, that we can actually even deepen our connection and actually unlock what is at the bottom of that conflict, what is informing it. And sometimes it'll take the whole night. Sometimes it'll take a number of weeks. And it's not just like me and the other person. If we're in conflict, maybe half the room might see my point of view based on their wounding and the other half might see the other person's point of view. So everybody gets activated and there is a way of actually like unfolding that that can help to free us from our trauma so that instead of compulsively just recreating our trauma, we actually that energy that's bound up in the repetition compulsion becomes available for creative expression and for love and for compassion. That's, in other words, what the, these communities are about. And it's funny because they organically kind of crystallize around me because I lost my family. So I don't have, like I said before, I don't have a family. And so I've created this really healthy family. And um, nice. and we all become really, really good friends. And I'm not in the role of, oh, I'm the teacher or I'm the guru. or No, no, no. I'll get triggered. I'll get into my unconscious stuff. I'll play it out. And then I can't facilitate because I'm like in my unconscious. So then that's just a role, the facilitator. Somebody else will pick that up. So basically over time, we all share all the roles. And it's real sangha. It's a real spiritual community where there's a real sense of equality. Because if I put myself above people and there is a hierarchy, that opens up the door to abuse power. And that's typically what happens in so many spiritual communities. And I'm just not interested in having power over people. I want to heal, you know, because I was so deeply, deeply traumatized. I mean, I almost didn't make it. I mean, think about how intense it was. I had a direct encounter with archetypal evil through my father in psychiatry, and then I lost my entire family. And everybody saw me as, oh, I'm just mentally ill. And it was just so over the top intense. Here I had a normal life and boom, this like happens. And you know, I've just been really fortunate, talk about alchemy of turning this like, the horrible, the prima materia, of turning the negative stuff into something helpful. Yeah, I can definitely relate to that on a radio show level. I don't, I kind of look at everybody as the same, you know, and then just have this conversation and come to realization about things. And, and you know what, uh, you wrote an article about this too. And I really agree 100% that when you really look at it, everybody's just kind of like wounded healers. So you got the wounded and then you got the wounded that kind of, they go through this awakening process and because they're going through this awakening process, begin to heal the people around them, not by teaching them a lot of times. It's more like relating to them and asking the questions and just getting a conversation going. I think sometimes, you know, healer, I mean, I've written extensively about the wounded healer and I know that archetype really well because, you know, I've been living it and that it's related to the archetype of the shaman. But the wounded healer, what it really has to do with, you know, we get we get wounded. Everybody gets wounded. It's like having a car that if you have long enough, it gets dented. And but instead of just, you know, kind of being in avoidance of our wound or trying to go around our wound or trying to get rid of our wound. No, it's actually experiencing our wound. And, um, you know, like my favorite definition of trauma is unexperienced experience. Because when at the moment of historical trauma, it's so overwhelming, we can't metabolize it in the normal way that we do with ordinary experiences. And so, and that, that informs the repetition compulsion, like encoded in the pathology of trauma of, of recreating our wound. That's the pathology. That's the symptomology of trauma, but encoded in that pathology is the, is the medicine. We're actually trying to experience something. Trauma is unexperienced experience. So we're actually trying to like, you know, consciously, you know, experience what we weren't able to experience at the moment of the wounding, of the trauma. And for me, for years, I was so 
feeling victimized or mad about how my father abused me and traumatized me and all that. But then I began to realize, wait a second, the wounding was like this, this sort of higher dimensional event. It was a sacred event. And by actually going through the wound and literally consciously experiencing the wound, that actually was the doorway that opened the idea of the shaman. They come back from the underworld and they come back bearing gifts. The wounded healer, by going through the wound, they actually get some sort of gift. And one of the gifts is that you're able to actually be with other people when they're in their wound. You're able to presence their wound and meet them there and not just feel unconsciously compelled to fix them or not just dissociate or not just like, you know, oh, I want to get away from this person. He's so wounded. But you're very comfortable in being with the other person's wound because you're very comfortable with that wounded part of yourself. And that's what we're all wanting. We're wanting to just be met and seen and heard and just presenced in our wound. We don't necessarily, we're not looking for advice. Yeah, it would be great if we could be fixed, but maybe the wound is an incurable wound. That's the mythology. And there is a way of carrying that wound. And Christ, by the way, was like the epitome of the wounded healer. I mean, think about the wound he went through by being crucified. But by being crucified, that was the doorway into the resurrected body, you know, into the body of glory. So, you know, that whole, I've written on my website, you know, there's a number of different articles on the wounded healer, and we're all wounded healers. And um, that's the that's the point, you know. And um, yeah, I just have you, a lot more to say about that, but that's the idea of the wounded healer. You ever Do you ever see it in like different links, though, or different, I guess, different values? Because some people uh, seem like they've been wounded deeper, you know, obviously some, some, well, we don't know that, but yeah, some yeah. things happen much worse than others you know some people it appears like they've been wounded really deeply and they and then they can become really heavy and really shut down and it's it's tragic you know and um but the idea being that you know um as best as we're able to to really to embrace the wound And, and here if i can just give a practice that really helps me So, you know, I still feel in, I feel this, you know, just an incredible pain from the trauma of what I've gone through. You know, I'm not in any way putting myself off as, oh, I'm this awakened person. Yeah, I cultivate compassion and try to feel joy. And there's a deep sense, I mean, I've lost my family and there was incredible, you know, abuse, emotional abuse that came through my father that wasn't even, he was just an instrument for some sort of deeper archetypal, darker energy. And it's like it, it unbelievably, and I write about this, it disfigured me. Like I feel like I'm operating at less than 1% of my operating capacity. And I'm thankful I'm still able to be of benefit. But the practice I want to share is that if I hold that wound in a way where I feel victimized or if I feel like, oh, I wish this wasn't happening, well, then I'm actually creating a circumstance of, of just, you know, endlessly reiterating sort of dissatisfactoriness by having that viewpoint of wanting something to be different than what's actually happening. But if in my imagination, and this is an actual practice in Buddhism, if I could actually say, well, wait a second, what would I be willing to feel this wound and to feel this pain? I mean, I'm feeling it anyway, but would I sign on to it and voluntarily agree to feel it if no one else would ever have to feel this? And the answer is, yeah, there is a part of me, the bodhisattva part of me that would actually choose to do that. So then I imagine, okay, I'm feeling the pain anyway, but I'm fighting against it, creating endless suffering. What if I start to welcome it? What if I start to embrace it all in my imagination of like, well, what if me feeling this I'm taking it off of everyone else. No one ever has to feel this negative energy because I'm consciously feeling it right now. Then all of a sudden, guess what? By holding that, holding the wound in that way, it doesn't last so long. It's not as solid. It all of a sudden begins to, to move. So I, when I start to welcome the wound and embrace the wound, paradoxically, the wound then isn't as problematic. And not only that, by doing that, it's cutting the duality of myself and others, because I would only do that from the bodhisattva point of view of like, oh, if I have the recognition that I'm actually not separate from others. 
And that's the awakened state. So by doing that practice, it's actually like healing in so many profound levels, you know, of my being by just actually embracing and welcoming the pain instead of fighting against it. And that's really core to the wounded healer figure. Yeah. Wow. Man, you couldn't say it better than that. Nobody could say it better than that. You know, the, the thing I realized too is, uh, you know, I don't like to uh, measure people by talent or woundedness, but man, it sure does seem like some of the deepest wounded people have so much to offer and it, because of their wounds, it's yeah, almost yeah, like yeah. they don't believe it or they'll never see it. And it kills me. I think of myself in that way. I mean, I'm, you know, I'm not identified. I mean, a real dangerous to be identified with my wound. I'm not identified with it, but man, I just cannot believe the the depth of the woundedness that I feel. And yet, you know, hopefully you're getting a sense of by this, you know, interview is that, you know, my whole practice is as best as I'm able to try to, you know, turn it into something that's helpful for people, you know, and that's really the archetype of the wounded healer. Because we're all wounded healer. We all have trauma. We're all in PTSD. Our species is suffering from collective PTSD, you know? That's right. Yeah, that's right. I, and it's like, it's, um, we, everybody I've talked to, uh, the listeners, the people that send me messages, we've got people that paint that like I've seen could probably sell for a ton of money. Uh, people that write novel stories, people that can podcast that play guitar and music. And I think it's all wonderful stuff. Uh, but the, what's the difference between that person and the person that becomes super successful at, and the more I talk to him about it, and success isn't everything. It's different for people. But my point is, is there's a barrier there that keeps some people from uh, realizing their true potential. Like maybe it's the Watiko thing you're talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, totally. And and the idea being is that I, I you know, what you just said made me want to just shed light again on the profound importance of expressing ourselves creatively, because Watiko is what's called this this daimonic energy. And um, daimon, the daimon is the inner voice, the guiding spirit. And it, etymologically, it's related to the genius, to one's vocation, to one's calling, to hearing a voice. The idea being, if you get into a relationship with your daimon, it's your angel, you'll find your genius, you'll find what you're here to do, your vocation, um, your calling, and your inner voice. And um, encoded in the daimon is the creative spirit. But if you turn away from that daimon, from that inner voice, from that calling, and you say, oh, if you have a story, oh, I'm not good enough, I can't do that, well, that daimon then constellates negatively and becomes a demon, okay? It's a quantum phenomena. Same thing with Watiko. Watiko is the source of the greatest evil, and it's the most incredible medicine. If it didn't uh, exist, we would have to invent Watiko. We need it for our evolution. But the point being that, you know, when we're called to get in touch with our inner guide, that, you know, if we don't assent to that, then us turning away from that calling, it, it will consolate that daimonic energy into a demon, and then we'll be in, in deep suffering. And so that's why encoded in the daimon, remember, is the creative spirit. That's why when we actually connect, and it doesn't make a difference what the medium is, anything can be creative, but when we actually, like, and for me, if I didn't find my creative voice, I mean, I, I don't even want to think about what would have happened to me, but it's profoundly healing to connect, you know, and just to become an instrument where your true, deeper self, who you actually are, can come through you. It's like what Christ was saying in the apocryphal text. If you bring forth what's within you, it'll save you. If you don't bring forth what's within you, it will destroy you. That's what I'm talking about. Wow. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. There, there is, um, there's something that I think is there. So you got this Watiko idea, right? This thing that we say is, let's just call it evil. But then there's also, I mean, what would be the opposite of that, right? Because even if you look, let's take religion. You bring up a lot of scriptures and stuff. But if you see, if you look at all religions, um, you know, uh, Muslim, Christian, Buddhism, you name it, uh, Jewism, Judaism, there's so much wisdom in some of this stuff that's buried 
that it all seems like there's something that's been here since the beginning of time that's kind of put itself here to wake us up and tells us these stories depending on what level of awareness that we're at, you know? Yeah. Yeah, well, it makes me think in the Bible, you know, people, a number of people had these visions of Christ. And to one person, he appeared as an old man, to another person as a young boy. The idea being that the the deity, it manifests to us according to our capability to perceive it, you know? Right. And, um, you know, that's, um, I mean, that's just like a dream. It's like trying to communicate with a part of us. And... Um, yeah, and you're right that all the, the real religions, the wisdom traditions, they're all really pointing at. Now, keep in mind, in the apocryphal text, they talk about Watiko. They don't call it Watiko. They talk about a counterfeiting spirit, you know, that impersonates us, that puts us on, which means to fool us and putting us on like a suit of clothes. It apes us. It, it will. It's like a mime. It will mimic and impersonate us. And then if we aren't awake, we then identify with its limited version of who we are. And then guess what? We've offered ourselves as an instrument for Watiko to incarnate in our world, and we've given ourselves away. And the Bible, the apocryphal texts of the Bible, are they call it a counterfeiting spirit. There, so that's what I mean when I say every wisdom tradition from time immemorial is articulating and pointing at Watiko in their own particular way. Right. Wow. And your book, this book here, before we let you go, I want to ask you about it. The quantum revelation it says, "Is this sting that left a review like the singer sting?" Um, yeah, musician wow. sting. Totally. That's cool. Yeah, yeah. yeah, he's a big. I mean, he really appreciates my work, and I am just so so grateful. You know. Yeah, I would and, be too. Who sting the police? Man, that's legendary. And he's reading your stuff, huh? Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. For sure. no, we're in touch, definitely. So your book uh, is more about looking at the the quantum revelation of how it's coming together. Uh, is that right? Is that what's mainly in the book? Yeah, I mean, what what it's mainly in the book is that quantum physics is a revelation. It's a living revelation. It's showing us the dreamlike nature. It's unlocking the creative uh, power that all of us have, and we're wielding unconsciously, most of us, in a way that's killing us. And it's actually, but if you look at quantum physics in the way that I'm sort of reflecting upon it, it can actually help you to to, to connect with that, we're like these these geniuses with amnesia. And, um, you know, so it, it's kind of, I mean, I, I you know, I'm, it's hard for me to, to talk about my own work, but I, I really, yeah. people to read it, because people, everybody who, or most people who read it are really activated and inspired by, by the book. You know? Well, even Dean Radin left a good review, said, you know, um, on the surface, this book is clearly a written discussion of the mind-blowing implications of quantum mechanics, but below the surface, it's a magic spell. It contains the power to fascinate, enchant, and transform any reader who manages to grasp what Paul Levy is really saying. So proceed with caution, because if you let it, this book can change your life. That's big, man. Dean Radin's been on the show, too, and he wrote that book, uh, Real Magic, or is Magic Real, Real Magic, and uh, I've got the book, and His he makes some pretty good points, too. His book came out like like pretty much one month before my my book. So yeah, no, I mean I feel really grateful that Dean, you know, he really appreciated the book. Well, the website is awakeninthedream.com. Paul Levy, thank you for coming on Lighting the Void. It's been a real pleasure and an honor talking to you on the program. For sure. I just can't thank you enough, really. Thank you. You guys go grab the book. You can get it. It's only like sixteen ninety five right there on the website, awakeninthedream.com. We'll leave all the links there for the podcast listeners as well. We'll be right back. Listening to the Fringe FM. Hey, I'm JM DeBoard, and when I want to talk about dreams, I look up my man Joe Root and his show, Lighting the Void. 
Have you suffered in silence or experienced stress from a paranormal experience? Even if it happened 20 years ago, when thinking or talking about it today still makes you feel sick to your stomach or makes your heart beat faster, or you suddenly can't breathe. Maybe you even feel those old, familiar signs of a panic attack trying to reach the surface. You could have unprocessed emotional responses. Those reactions of terror and trauma are no different than living through a horrible assault, childhood abuse, or a terrible car accident. It can be nearly impossible to find help. The very instance of seeing a ghost or encountering a cryptid could be clinically described as seeing or hearing things that aren't there. You could be considered psychotic, or at best, you're just not taken seriously. Out of a growing mountain of research, the National Institute for Integrative Healthcare showed that 8 out of 10 veterans who completed just 6 one-hour EFT sessions no longer tested positive for PTSD. If you've had paranormal trauma, you can contact Metaphorical Archaeology by calling 214-995-3754. Again, that's 214-995-3754 for a discreet consultation. I think by now we can get the information. I love magic, and on Lighting the Void, each and every week, you will get to hear shows about magic, mysticism, and many other subjects that stretch your mind and imagination. So when I got my mind on the magic and the magic on my mind, I listen to Lighting the Void on the Fringe FM. It's magic. May the gods look with favor upon you. You're wondering what we're going to do to you, guys. My name is Jake. I'm from Billings, Montana, and I am a Void Walker. Hey, Joe Root. Thanks for lighting the void. This is Janine in the bluegrass of Kentucky, and I am a Void Walker. What's up, guys? This is Damien from San Marcos, Texas, and I'm a Void Walker. I listen to the show to keep myself aligned with the world. Hi, this is Laura, a.k.a. Laura Lavender. I'm from Las Vegas, and I listen to Lighting the Void because it helps me understand some of the strangest experiences I've had. So thanks for all that you do and for always being there for us, Joe. Okay, here we go. Ancientlifeoil.com. Ancientlifeoil.com. Now, this is for CBD. Ancientlifeoil.com. Again, for CBD. Where do I get CBD? Ancientlifeoil.com. It's pretty good stuff. Organic, non-GMO. We are the Ferrari of CBDs. Ancientlifeoil.com. You know, they say when you mention a person's name three times when you first meet that you're going to remember. So I'd say to you, nice to meet you, Ancientlifeoil.com. It's Ancientlifeoil.com, right? Nice to know that you help people. Ancientlifeoil.com. Think about this. Occasional stress, occasional anxiety, occasional inflammation, occasional stiffness, and intruders that get you down. Ancientlifeoil.com. Okay, so I'm going to give you a fact for the day. So Ancient Life Oil does not help you with business deals. Hold on a second. If you feel better, it could help you make a better decision. Okay, I'm wrong. Just remember to go to ancientlifeoil.com. All right, everyone. This is Justin from the UK. Excuse the chitty chitty. If you're into the fringe and you want to hear the brass tacks, me old China plate, Joe Roop, and his guests on Light in the Void will open your mince pies. You need to shut your north and south and use your 10 speed gears and listen to them bubble. You could hear a Barry Crocker, no Brussels, but he ain't no holy friar. Anyway, you beat a Barnaby Rudge and take a butcher's. To call Joe, pick up the phone, dial 1-800-588-0335, toll free from the United States or Canada. That's right. Yeah, we do have a phone you can call in, by the way. It's one 800 I'm watching the chat room, Dan, and I'm seeing people in there say, like, well, I don't know what to say. I'm all out of questions. And it makes me wonder, you know, like, are we talking about the same topics too much on here? Um, I don't think so. I think, I think by just going around and back and forth with this quantum stuff, I call it quantum stuff because I don't want to try to sound smart. I, I think, man, we're going to be, I predict, because that's what radio hosts do, right? They predict and they brag about how they were right later. And I've tried mm-hmm. that, and nobody's given me recognition, especially when it came to the asteroids and stuff. But anyways, um, I predict in 2020 <laughs> that science, some mainstream science or something is going to have to, somebody's going to come out and really say, okay, 
we've got to look at consciousness now as a mainstream science. Almost kind of like, you know, how Trump took on, like, the Space Force is going to come out in 2020. Because that's coming. And there's no doubt about it. We're going to see it for real in 2020. But I think mainstream science is going to have to take take it on. We need more money behind it. I could be wrong, but I think this is going to be it. It's got to be, man. It's 20. 20 we're supposed to have like flying cars by now dan oh and moon base alpha tell me about it yeah i mean when you was a kid back in the 1980s and you said man if i live well i was a kid in the 1980s anyways but if i live to the year 2020 we're gonna have flying cars and all kinds of stuff we don't have flying cars we don't have they had them in we barely had got phones yeah, uh, mechanics. What was it? Mechanics Illustrated or something like that. I can't forget what it was. Something like that. But it was like, um, yeah, I think it was Mechanics Illustrated. They had uh, flying cars back then, and, and those they had a whole bunch of stuff like that. Everything that you thought of, they had. You know what I mean? That you thought was going to be coming. That you know, and usually when you got those books and they had all of this stuff, it was usually fifteen years after the fact that they already had it. Fifteen to twenty years after the fact. So, you know, I mean, I agree with you that I hope, for, you know, 2020 becomes actually something to, that goes down in history because it needs it. <laughs> yeah, it does. <laughs> we I mean, really need it. The, we got the drones and stuff, but we don't have the flying cars yet. And I've been, we've been seeing those flying cars in magazines forever. But, you know, mm -hmm. but I don't, I don't think talking about these same things over and over again to me is for a reason. I'll tell you why. When you specifically look at alchemy, I'm mm. we're really seeing like how everybody looks at this different, right? You remember yeah. me? We had this discussion about okay, alchemy's in the laboratory. No, alchemy's this Carl Jung thing. No, alchemy's your energetic body changing into a body of light for real. But you see all these people that do these massive studies, and Paul Levy. I mean, he's been on coast to coast. Clyde Lewis. He's been doing this stuff for a while. But still, yet yeah, all of these experts in their field, they all have different ideas of alchemy. And I even noticed that in the secret societies, if you take like the Alpha Omega, which is a Rosicrucian society versus the Hermetic uh, Society with uh, Mark Stavis, they have a, a different ideas of the Philosopher's Stone. So all of us, right. the Void Walkers here, we may not be as thoroughly as studied as some of these people. But we're still asking the same questions. You ever noticed oh, yeah. that? Oh yeah. Well, still the thing asking is, the same is that, damn question. Yeah, but the thing is, is that what ha what we wind up doing, or at least I, what I, from what I see, is that when we get on the same subjects and the same topics and stuff like that, is that we start realizing that we're all asking the same questions, and we're all having this, the same, you know, desires and stuff like that to know what's going on. And, but we wind up focusing more on the differences than we do on the on the similarities, you know, mm -hmm. the similarities of our experiences, the similarities of our desires, the similarities of our, you know, our maturity level, you know, the whole nine yards, you know, discoveries, whatever have you, you know. And then, but it was like I was saying earlier in the chat room, it was like, I, I'm at my best when I just drop my ego. Because when I drop my ego, then I can allow everything that you're telling me, everything that you're expressing to me. And I can take, you know, I can take all of that in without, you know, focusing on the, on the differences, you know, the differences of my experiences, you know, compared to your experiences or to anybody else's for that matter. You know, and I think once you start becoming more of a group, like he was saying, you know, you, you tend to develop that, that is something that you, you kind of grow together. And I think there are audiences really beginning to grow together you yeah. know because they're all having the same questions they're having the same questions so much so that it's transferring and the answers are actually happening live on the air as they're listening and this is why they were saying that you know they turn around and like i don't know what to say no one call in all my questions. questions are getting answered yeah yeah but that's great you know because it's like you know there it is <laughs> you know <laughs> Yeah, that's cool. You guys, are, yeah, you guys are amping more than you you take credit for, you know. Well, we got this. I mean, we got this killer phone system, right? So I actually mm -hmm. did some study, and not as much as I wanted to, because I've been a little preoccupied with other stuff. 
but how sure. to get the phones to light up a little bit more and it's all controversy man that's ma- that's like the biggest one create controversy so i'm not the kind of guy that wants to i've got to figure out another route because in the in the long term i want the show to be syndicated i want truck drivers calling in everybody calling in you know but I, right. i'm not the kind of guy that wants to create controversy just to have people call in the show don't sit right with it. it's just like we're going nowhere i can't do that you know i mean it's like do a show about what came first the chicken or the egg or do you like jelly or peanut butter better call line four or and then you get into pop culture and all that stuff is so freaking mundane to me dude you know i hear you so what we got to figure this out we'll figure it out you know um i've bribed people i guess uh that works sometimes but the call in when we do open lines night a lot of people call in so maybe that's maybe people just like it the way things are i'm I'm good with that true true people like uh they like the you know they like regularity that's normal they get comfortable with it you you notice how i keep bringing up with the guest how you know i'm running into this talent in my life that you know the biggest talents i've ever seen are the, the ones that have the biggest wounds and i think a lot of this stuff is because people have these uh these subconscious wounds that are buried in them so deep that they've got this pre-running program that they just can't do what others do i'll give you an example man i'm just some like um podunk redneck guy from arkansas i'm not playing that's what i am just a regular joe you can't get any more regular than me and some people will say, oh, well, you're putting yourself down or you're doing this. No, no, no. I'm not putting myself down. I'm just telling you. I'm just a regular dude. But hey, All I need is a modium AD and I can get as regular <laughs> as you. I'm just a potato. <laughs> you know? That's it. But I've had people tell me, like, man, what you do is so great. and this, I wish I could do that. And I'm like, you can. Like, what is telling you that you can? And I wonder if it's this Watiko stuff that he's talking about. You know, I don't know, but it's I, a dark cabal. No, it could be just Watiko. They sell it on the corner. It's everywhere, right? <laughs> but I've got this problem with Buddhism. Just one problem: that suffering is necessary. I don't. I think we can get past that eventually. Yeah, yeah I don't buy into that. Should I we? don't buy into that? I mean, there's. You know, we, I think we went around in this conversation before, but. I don't think there is a, a necessary, I mean, everybody's path is different. I come, you know, I will, I will, you know, I'll accept that. Yeah. Everybody's path is, nece- everybody's path is different. And so everybody has to go through their own life experiences and stuff like that. But when it comes to like suffering to that point where, you know, that's the only way that things will change that it, I don't believe that. I really don't believe that. I believe in intervention. I believe that things can be shown. I believe in seeds being planted and being nourished and and growing. You know, I, I, people can see differences and experience differences without having the pain of bringing them to that point. Yeah, I guess. But happens for kids i mean on the other hand have you ever met somebody that had like a that didn't have a weird background or some type of suffering they're kind of boring so maybe it is necessary maybe suffering is necessary i don't know i just don't want to believe that just to be totally honest with you that we've got to suffer to learn anything but what do we consider boring you know because you know that's a different story because life is easy when it's boring and that's a truism (laughs) you know it really is you get up in the morning, you do what you got to do. You take care of what you need to take care of. You go to bed and start the day all over again. You know, really easy. It Kinda should boring, be. It should but be. life is good. <sighs> okay, so I want to address. So here's what I think Watiko is. Watiko. This is, comes from <laughs> the Native American Watiko, right? Uh, probably something I shouldn't talk about on the air, but I, I'm going to. So when we started the show, and I'm, I'm going to figure this out, come hell or high water. When we started the show, the demographic of the show was mainly, I'm just going to be honest with you, it was mainly females, right? 
Like it was right like 15, 18% female. The rest was, uh, no, it was like 40 something percent female. And the rest was male between the ages of 28 and like 47 or whatever. Now the tides have turned tremendously. Right. And so have the donations. And I have to wonder, is it because I'm a, I'm not, I'm no longer available. Like it, to me, that's Watiko, right? That's evil. You know, it's like I listen to your show because you're available, and then now that you're not, I'm not going to anymore. What What's up with that, man? Like if it wasn't a reality, I wouldn't be even talking about it. What else could have shifted the tides like that? You tell me. If you got any other ideas, I'm, I'm all I've, ears. I've already said it, and I don't think I can repeat it in a radio format. <laughs> <laughs> exploitive, deletive, exploitive, deletive, <laughs> BS. It's like, what do you want from me? You know, I I'm just not... called it as it was. I really did. You know, you know, I did. So I just called it as it is, you know, and, and it's true. Well, all right. So basically they're not here, right? So we could talk about them. Yeah. <laughs> right. So basically it's, that's really what it was. It was, you know, it's just as you said, we want you because you're available, available, you know, you got that velvety southern drawl you know and you're good looking and this and that and blah 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 blah. and so long as you're available <laughs> you know we'll just keep on you know bring coming around man and then the, all of a sudden you know the uh the tree sniffers decided you know to find another fire hydrant man that's terrible <sighs> that's terrible but you know what it does say this that i will say this for real as we go on and on and on into this radio show we really start to find out like, Hey, who's really here about the subject matter for real, you know? And it does break my heart to see some people like go based on whatever agendas in their mind or whatever they're actually trying to do with me. But it's almost like a, Hey, I'm glad that, that, that gets weeded out. But at the same time, it doesn't have to be that way. You no. know, like I, I thought well. you were here because you liked exploring the topics and stuff, not about the attention that you get or what you think is going to be a future outcome. I mean, this ain't Beverly Hills 90210, man. This is late night talk radio. It's what it Agreed. is. Agreed. Agreed. And I love all of you, especially the ones that stay. <laughs> you stuck <laughs> around. I love you even more, you know. But, yeah. but I mean, our it, listenership's it, going up. It actually is. It's just the demographics have switched. Um, mm. And I don't know. It could be because maybe we were talking about, I'm just asking. I'm not assuming. Maybe we're, we're talking about too much uh, conspiracy stuff, you know? I don't know. And, I, well, I guess what I'm asking you guys to do, especially um, uh, on the, especially the people that are thinking about bouncing like that, like give us some feedback, you know, tell us why. If the tide shift, tell us what you want us to talk about more. We used to get feedback all the time. Now it's more like all we get is, uh, you know, thanks for the show. You're doing a great job, which I love, but I would, I need just as much feedback too, because if you want to talk about a subject that I really am into, then I'll help me and Dan. We did shows all night long without guests sometimes. You sure. Know? And they've been a big hit. Where so. could they send that feedback, Joe? to talk back at the friends dot FM, or you can just email, you can email me to contact at lighting the void.com or you can call, call the uh, speak pipe number and leave feedback. We've had actually did have a woman leave some feedback about that. And we're going to get on that too. So any, any of those avenues, you can leave feedback about the show. Um, but yeah, it's just weird. That's all. I'm just, I'm just making a statement that I saw uh, the demographic of the show just switch. You know, and I've never seen that before. And I don't know what the catalyst was. I have an assumption, but I hope I'm wrong. I really hope I'm wrong. Know. You know, it might flip again. You know, it's just a matter of energies. It'll happen. So what we're going to do, and I'm hoping to have this up by tomorrow, is we're going to do another drawing like we did with Jamie, who won last time. But we're going to do it on tears. Like everybody's going to, there's going to be some special edition swag that only the donor whoever the winner of this stuff is is going to have so if you donate five dollars or more then you're going to get um 
a special edition Void Walkers sticker. I might do a poster too, though. And then if you do $10 or more, you're going to get a special edition Void Walker t-shirt and $20 or more, uh, will you'll enter you for the hoodie. And you know, if, if you want to win, go more. That's all I'm saying. Cause there might be like four or five people that do the $20 thing, but there might be 60 people that do the $5 thing. So I'm just telling you, you know, and in any way, and if you can't support the show at all, uh, some of you people out there that are leaving reviews and just sharing the show, or even I've seen people on Twitter and this is really cool. Like they'll be in their Twitter feeds and someone will say, Hey, um, you know, I want to find a new podcast to listen to or something and they'll recommend this show. They'll say, go listen to that. That's great too. Right on. You know what? Well, we need to do some type of recognition for those folks too, that actually go out of their way and do that. But, you know what um, I'm curious about? If if people could actually respond to us and give us some feedback also. Like we're 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 working on commercial free episodes. Yeah. And I'd like we would like we would love to hear from you if you think that this is a good idea that you would definitely be interested yeah, in. Yeah, because it's a or lot not. of damn work. <laughs> it is a lot of damn work. Yeah. I mean, we're working on close to three hundred episodes and uh just e- uploading them back and forth is uh daunting in itself the editing is not as bad but yeah we want to know if this is a, if this is a good idea if you guys would you know because i know listening to listening to the shows on on the you know while you're in the car and on the trucks and stuff like that can be kind of crazy when all the commercials go on and you'd like to listen to it you know commercial free yeah. you know we try you not know? to you know we try not to do more like ads like a lot of syndicated shows will do ads every 15 minutes or so. I try not to do that. Uh, yeah. But still, yet yeah, I know so the commercials are annoying. And the, the subscriber thing we're working on is not just going to be commercials. It'll, it's going to have some other stuff, too. Now, tomorrow, we're, this week's going to be different because uh, Friday night, instead of doing open lines, Mary DeSena is going to come on. So Yay. we had a Yeah, for the New Moon special. So we had a guest mm-hmm. that canceled tomorrow night. A vet Rose had to cancel. I was really looking forward to that, but that's okay. So what we might do is actually do our open lines, like Christmas thing, open lines or something tomorrow night, um, and then have the rest of the guests come on the week because we got Claire Broad that's coming on um, to talk about, what is she coming on to talk about? Oh, life after death, uh, what the dead are dying to teach us. Then uh, Steve and Evan Strong are going to come on. And, nice. um, yeah, then we're going to have Mary. So I'm thinking we're nice. going to try to do the open line stuff tomorrow. I just got to find a, some cool topics to talk about. I want to do it Christmas related because I'm actually for once this year, Dan, I'm not so Scroogey. I'm actually having a decent, I'm kind of actually feeling a little bit of Christmas spirit here. You know, that's excellent. That's a first for me. So I think we might do that tomorrow night and hopefully you can join us. You're going to be around tomorrow, brother. Uh, okay. Okay. <laughs> You're live on the air right now. Tell me, are you going to be here or not? Uh, sure. See, yeah. See, y'all sure. like his enthusiasm. He loves coming on the show, don't you? Sure. <laughs> I've just been bouncing back and forth. You know, everything's been going crazy. I just went through a nightmare. Did you? You all right? <sighs> yeah, no, nah, the... Yeah, no. One of the one of the pieces I was working on the bike just totally took a dump, and so now both cylinders are like at thirty psi. And then I got another video card, so I could do some more editing, faster editing on the on the machine. And it's all it. I just showed a picture on one of my on Instagram and Facebook. It's like you. Can, it's unusable. Oh, completely God. unusable. So that was like you know, yay! Let's like blow a bunch of money that we can't freaking use anything. <laughs> Well, you just need a break. You just need to come on the show and hang out with us for a night and take a break. That's all. Yeah, that's all. Stop trying That'll to get work. compression. It ain't going to happen. We're just, we'll all just raise money and get you a new bike. That's what we need decompress. to decompress. Yeah. No, I need a new van. <laughs> Do you for real? A van? Yeah. Yeah. It's well, like 25 to 2800 bucks. I'll tell you something else that's cool that's happening before we get out of here. Um, Later in this week, we are, you know, I was going to raise, try to raise money to get 
the uh, equipment we need to syndicate with terrestrial stations. But I believe that in a few days, we're going to have that. I don't know for mm-hmm. sure, but this person that's offering to help and get that stuff is uh, usually not a BSer. And so we might actually have the full fledged syndicated studio, and that all we need is just that uh, curse delay and the uh, encoder, and we're good to go. And it's going to happen. So Merry Christmas. Woof. Right. Oof. Yeah. Woof. <laughs> it's a big chunk of change for sure. So, I mean, I'm feeling pretty blessed right now. You got to be honest with you. I should think so. Yeah. Um, Congrats. As Joe, as Joe Roop is going to let me tattoo him live during the show. Oh, that would be a good idea. Only if would you it? have black lingerie. I'll wear black lingerie <laughs> and let and let somebody tattoo me. <laughs> well, I can tell you this. I do have plans in the near future to go to uh, um, New Orleans, you know, eyes. So if we go down there, then we'll definitely come get a tattoo, right? You got to get the LTV logo. Yeah. We got to get the sigil. Who's yeah. going to be the first to do that? It's going to be me. Dun, 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 dun. But, um, yeah, so we'll see you guys tomorrow night. We're probably going to do open lines. And uh, thanks for coming on at the end here, Dan, brother man. <laughs> nope. Sure, man. Reverend Potato himself, the Reverend Dan Lopez. Reverend, Reverend Spud. Yeah. Big shout out to Pacho <laughs> for making this happen. Also, uh, shout out to Don, Dennis, Jeremy Scott, a program director. All of you guys in the Fringe FM chat room, Eric Markham, everybody, you know, don't forget, Markham is our partner here on the network. He's always in the background watching. Give him a shout out. Tell him hi. And please don't copy this show without written permission, uh, especially on YouTube. We'll see you guys tomorrow night. Main music was by Chronox. Go check him out at chronoxofficial.com. See you guys tomorrow night. Good night, y'all. staff. Listener discretion is advised. It sounds funny. Oh.